Good morning and welcome to the fifth annual Regional Economic Conditions Conference hosted by the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Before we begin the keynote portion of the program with Best Buy CEO Corey Berry and Bank President Neil Kashkari, there are a few small housekeeping items. First, a copy of the video link for today's conference will be emailed to all registered attendees next week. Copies of PowerPoints will also be available. Second, speakers will entertain questions at the end of each session as time allows. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box on Zoom. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy the conference. With that, I'll turn it over to Bank President Neil Kashkari. Neil? Good morning. My name is Neil Kashkari, President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Welcome to our fifth annual Regional Economic Conditions Conference. We're really great, grateful that you could join us this morning. The Minneapolis Fed is part of our nation's central bank, the Federal Reserve System. We, are the ninth, we represent the ninth Federal Reserve District. Now, what does that mean? In 1913, Congress created the Federal Reserve, but they did something unique. They said they didn't want the central bank simply housed in the nation's capital. They wanted, they wanted it spread out around the country so that all the regions of our country and the regions of our economy had a voice in the monetary policy process. So they created 12 independent Federal Reserve banks scattered around the country, the ninth of which is here in this building, the Minneapolis Fed. Our job at the Minneapolis Fed is to represent this region in the monetary policy work of the central bank. And what is this region? It's Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and Northwestern Wisconsin. A big part of our jobs are to travel around the region and to get to know uh, community leaders, business leaders, labor leaders, civic leaders, to understand what is happening in our regional economy and then bring that insight back to Washington, D.C. So I go to Washington, at least pre-pandemic, uh, every six weeks for Federal Open Market Committee meetings. We now do them virtually, but I'm looking forward to going back in person soon. And part of what I'm doing in those meetings is talking about what's happening here in our regional economy. Well, five or six years ago, we said, instead of only going out to meet with people across our district, why don't we invite some leaders from around the district in once a year to give their outlooks for their regional economy? And that's why we started this Regional Economic Conditions Conference. And so uh, it's been very successful. We've had a lot of experts come in from around the, uh, around the region, as well as leaders such as uh, former, excuse me, the CEO of Lando Lakes, Beth Ford, was a former keynote speaker. We've had political leaders as well from across the aisle, uh, just bringing their perspective. And we're thrilled that Best Buy CEO Corey Berry has joined us here today. Now, this today's conference is focused on the regional economy but it's also focused on some new initiatives that we've launched to be more diverse and more inclusive in who we talk to to gain our economic insights. So more than a year ago, we changed how we at the Minneapolis Fed report out on economic conditions in what we call the Beige Book. We put a concerted focus on minority and women-owned businesses, and we put a concerted focus on workers and what workers are experiencing. Hearing from businesses is very important but hearing from workers directly is also very important, and that's really going to be the focus of the conference here today. So let me, um, let me just turn to our wonderful keynote speaker that we have here today, Corey Berry, CEO of Best Buy. Uh, Best Buy is a national leader of roughly $47 billion in revenue, the leading provider of consumer technology services with over 100,000 employees, we're thrilled that the CEO of uh, Corey Berry could join us here today. Um, she's had a front row in the pandemic facing challenges as a business, but also facing challenges uh, supporting your workers, but also supporting your customers through all of this. Uh, Best Buy has gone through transformational change. You've been there for more than 20 years, became CEO in 2019. Uh, I'm just thrilled that you were willing to join us, Corey. So thank you for being here. And uh, if it's okay with you, we'll dive into our conversation. That would be wonderful. It's a pleasure to be here. So thank you for the invite. Absolutely. So let's let's look historically, at least for the last couple of years. The pandemic surprised all of us. You know, we look out for risk, but none of us saw a pandemic on the horizon. No. Every company, large and small, had to adjust to protect its employees while keeping its operations running. Best Buy has a thousand, hundred thousand employees. Yeah. You are a in you know in person provider. So in many ways, you're in the front line of the exposure and the risk of the pandemic. So you had all of those challenges. And at the same time, you had customers saying, we need you more than ever. So could you just, I'm sure there's, we could spend an hour on this, but if you could just look back over the last two years, what stands out to you as either a particular challenge for Best Buy 
or something you're particularly proud of? Yeah, so at the very start of the pandemic, what we kind of all forget is we didn't know anything. We didn't know how the virus spread. We didn't know how virulent it was. What we knew as leaders is our customers were getting scared and our employees were clearly getting scared. And so at the very beginning of the pandemic, we set out three guiding principles that we would prioritize the health and safety of our employees and customers first, that we would protect the employee experience as much as we could for as long as we could, and that we would come out the other side of this, not just a vital company, but a vibrant one. And we used those to guide us. So we actually voluntarily moved all of our stores to curbside only within 48 hours of making the decision. And we did that because we thought we could still, to your point, we could still serve customers. But at that point, knowing so little, we could protect our employees. And it was decisions like that that have been made over and over and up to and including last week where we're still trying to deal with a variant now that is incredibly virulent. Yeah. If I'm most proud of anything, it is the ingenuity, adaptability, and agility of our teams. And every issue that's come up, they're just drive to find a solution and to meet those needs for the customers. That, that for me has been one of the biggest, retail has always been like, you think bricks and mortar, right. and you think a lack of agility and just the old way of doing things. And we have tried everything from virtual consultations, we have a virtual store, we have uh, call center experts that you can call on, we have changed the way we operate in store and using self-checkout. I mean, just the amount of change that's happened in two years has phenomenally jumped what we ever had seen before. So that's that's one thing. The second thing though, and maybe it's a little um, less tactical, is how I'm watching our leaders lead. Um, never before have we spent so much time talking about, we talk about inclusive leadership behaviors, and we talked about them before the pandemic. They are vulnerability, empathy, courage, and grace. And never in my career have our leaders consistently exhibited those behaviors in more meaningful ways. I mean, how many times do we all get on Zoom and you look at the person across from you and you're like, oh, today's hard, isn't it? <laughs> and, and to be able to invite those conversations, even with our customers who are also having hard days, that real human side of business, um, that really has been pushed to the forefront. And for me, that, that actually has been perhaps a positive side effect of all of this. That's uh, actually, you made me think of that, which is some of these changes sound like they're going to sustain for the better. Yeah. And hopefully all of our organizations will be more nimble going forward as a result of this? I think so. And in, in retail in particular, we now have a world where the customer is in charge. So think about how much our own behaviors have changed in the last two years. Like I knew the world was going to be a different place when my dad started ordering groceries online, right? And grabbing them <laughs> curbside. That's nothing he would have ever contemplated. It might have been a five-year ramp for him if he ever got there. And yet overnight, within a span of a month, he had conquered that digital experience. And when you start to conquer those digital experiences, you expect them more and more, no matter which retailer you're interacting with, right. or even things that the Delta app can do. If the Delta app can do that, I'm going to expect that the Best Buy app can do right. that. And so I think we're now in a world where the customer is in charge. They're going to help us figure out what, what, what's the way they want to shop. Even right now, um, if I'm nervous now about my health and going out, well, then I'm very comfortable using the digital tools at my disposal. That may look different in six months where I'm more comfortable using the physical tools at my disposal. And I think that's good. Now, I, I'm, this, this was not planned, but you're, you're making me think of lots of questions. You know, in, in the banking world, there's been a lot of consolidation, and it's a real challenge for community banks because customers are demanding apps that are seamless, that you know, get them access to their financial services 24-7. Right. And it's hard for small banks to be able to deploy those technologies yeah. that a large bank can do. I imagine it's the exact same thing in retail. It is the exact same thing. And it's, um, in some ways, I'm watching small business struggle, and we are even trying to think about ways we might be helpful to small businesses. Mm -hmm. Could they leverage some of our tools to help their business? Because I, I do think for companies with scale, you have the ability to kind of navigate these changes very quickly. It, you can see it, it's much harder if you're a community business or a community bank in your example. It's, it, it's not as easy, and yet those customer expectations are so high. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, let's, let's turn to the economy. So, at the, mini, or at the Federal Reserve, we always talk about our dual mandate, which is one is stable prices, what we define as 2% inflation. Right. The other is maximum employment, as many Americans as working as possible. 
Obviously, we're seeing very high inflation right now. It surprised me, it surprised, I think, many of my colleagues how high it is and how persistent it has been. And so we're trying to understand the drivers of that high inflation and when, when it's likely to go back to more historical levels of around 2%. So one side of this equation is the labor market. The labor market has recovered a lot since the depth of the pandemic, but we're still four or five million workers short of where we should be. When people asked me six to nine months ago, what's keeping those, um, and by the way, we hear businesses large and small saying, we need workers, we need workers, we need workers. So the demand for workers has recovered even more quickly than the supply has recovered. So six to nine months ago, when people asked me, well, what's keeping workers on the sidelines? I offered three possible hypotheses. I said, it's probably some combination of these three things. Number one is people are still afraid of the virus. And hopefully when vaccines are widely available, the fear will diminish. Uh, number two, schools were shut across the country. Huge challenge for families. You have children, I have younger, even younger children, huge challenge for families. And then third, uh, there were these enhanced unemployment benefits that especially low income workers, people said, well, this looks pretty attractive. I can wait. Well, the enhanced unemployment benefits expired. We saw no uptick in labor supply because of that. Schools have mostly reopened, though these last couple of weeks and the next couple of weeks, there are a lot of schools that are shut because of Omicron. And there's still fear of the virus, even though vaccines are widely available. I'm just curious, as you know, you have 100,000 employees. As you look at the labor market, how do you see it? What are the challenges and where do you think it goes from here? Yeah, so like you, I got six, nine months ago, a lot of questions about especially the um, enhanced unemployment benefits as being a causal factor. Mm -hmm. And at that point, and, and I've continued to build out my own hypothesis, um, people didn't quit because of the benefits. They maybe kept them out of the workforce a little bit longer, but there were, I, there's five factors that I see at play. The first is people are still nervous about their health, even vaccinated or not, even before Omicron. There still is a concern, depending on your life situation. Maybe you have little kids who aren't vaccinated. Right. Maybe you're a caregiver. There still is real concern about health. So you've got that. The second is childcare. And it's everything from schools all the way to daycares. Mm -hmm. And daycares in particular have been very inconsistent. And they've had to send kids home to quarantine. And while some of the schools were open in the fall, even those could be inconsistent, depending on if teachers were infected. And it's this inconsistency of care that I think is really hard on families. Like we were chatting before, my, we found out on Thursday at 3 that my son would be distance learning on Friday. Mm -hmm. that, that is very hard for families to adapt to with that level of speed. So that is continuing. I think the, the third thing is just flat out burnout. I think everyone does hit a point, and especially in retail, it's been two years, and two years sometimes arguing with customers about masks <laughs> and um, you know, not being able to do some of the fun things that make retail fun, like hanging out together in a break room. I mean, it, it's, these are really stressful jobs, um, and they weren't pondered to be stressful when you signed up for them. They're right. different jobs too. So there's that. Um, the fourth is, I also think people have realized different lifestyle expectations. So I don't know for you, but for me, it's been a long time in my career before I didn't travel for a year. And I was home for most dinners. And even if I was working, I was, you know, maybe working at my home office. Yeah. That sets some different lifestyle expectations. And I think people are making different career choices because they all woke up one day and said, well, wait a second, I actually like my family and I'd like to spend more time with them. And then finally, there's a lot of optionality right now. Mm -hmm. There are a lot, it's this weird dichotomy. There are a, a lot of open jobs right now. And you, not only are there many open in many different industries, they also can be done remotely in a lot of cases. Right. And so now the country has opened up as potential. I don't have to look just in Minneapolis. I can look in North and South Dakota. And that I think has changed the dynamic deeply. So my point of view, I think we're gonna see this labor market churn unfortunately, for quite some time, because I don't see any of those five factors evening out in the nearest term. And, you know, when we examine it with my economists, where are the, where are the, they're the biggest shortages of workers? One area that comes up is long haul truckers. I hear this everywhere I go. Yeah. But then I, you know, when we examine it, it seems as though anecdotally, it's easier to find local truckers. And the reason is kind of the lifestyle choice. People are saying, well, I don't want to be from home away from home for a week. I'd rather sleep in my own bed, be able to see my family at night. Uh, or the, another example is, if you look at the job data, daycare jobs are way down. And why is that? You know, prior to the pandemic, we saw in Minnesota, a lot of home-based daycares were closing. Yeah. 
And people try to understand why that is. I saw analysis that said, if you ran your own home daycare, after all of your expenses and all your hardship, you were making around minimum wage. So people said, well, why am I going to go through all this heartache to do this? I could maybe get a job at Best Buy or I could get a job at Target, earn more money and have a better quality of life and less stress in doing so. So I think the churn you talked about is exactly right. And people are saying, I'm going to, the, the, the toughest jobs are losing workers. And they're saying there are more attractive options out there. Yeah, I'm, I'm very worried about our teachers as an example. And again, two years of very difficult work. And um, I have enough teachers in my life, I'm sure you do too, who are just saying, I, I just can't work like this anymore. The joy of teaching has, yeah. has changed. And so I do think we're gonna have to think structurally about how do we make some of these jobs more appealing over time? Because you know we need nurses. I mean, nurses have just had an incredible two years yeah. and it's not letting up anytime soon. So again, structurally, how do we think about as, as a nation, how we're going to continue to, to fund and fuel some of these occupations over time. And how, given that you have 100,000 employees, are you able, presumably the answer is yes, but are you able to bring in the people that you need of all skill levels to, for your company? We've been fortunate to be able to attract and retain um, employees. Now, that being said, there are areas that are incredibly competitive, things like digital, mm -hmm. analytics, all of data science, those are incredibly competitive areas. Um, it is harder for us. We get fewer applications than we've gotten historically, especially at the store level, but we're still able to bring in some of those employees. We made moves really early in the pandemic too. We raised our minimum wage to 15, mm -hmm. three months into the pandemic. Our average wage is closer to $18 an hour for our hourly workforce. And so we are working very hard in, and you hit it in those areas of the company that are like, we have consultants who go into your home and help you with your technology. And those consultants are like the special sauce of what we do at Best Buy. And so we're absolutely investing in areas like that where we just need those employees to stick with us. Yeah. This. You know, um, we all have anecdotes and sometimes the anecdotes are very uh, eye-opening. Yeah. So there's a convenience store near my house that I go to frequently and a gas station. And the proprietor owns five gas station convenience stores around the Twin Cities. He's been doing it for 20 years. And he had to help one and sign up. Or he has a help wanted set up. So I asked him, I said, what's it like? Are you able to find workers? And he said, oh my gosh, it's, I've never seen anything like this before. I've been in this business for 20 plus years. It's never like this. I can't get anybody to apply. I said, well, what is it normally like? Mm -hmm. He said, normally I put the help wanted sign up and that day I have a line of qualified people to choose from. And that's what normal is. And so I understand why he's frustrated, but it also opened my eyes. Why is that what we call normal? I mean, that seems like what he's used to prior to the pandemic is the pendulum had swung so far in favor of business. Maybe it's, it's too far in the other direction now and it's not sustainable, but at least, you know, my humble opinion is I'm not sure that we're trying to go back to that old world. That something where workers have more choices is probably a better thing for everybody. I, I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, on one hand, you talk about it as wage inflation. To me, it is, no, we are just trying to make sure our employees have a livable wage for really, honestly, very hard work. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. The other thing that's been amazing is by putting the um, worker in control, we've even changed the way we think about how do we secure talent? What's the right talent? Really, what qualifications do you need to do a job? How do we reskill our workforce and ensure that they have not just vertical, but what I call horizontal careers, the ability to move from maybe being a geek squad agent in New York to working on our digital and technology team remotely for the corporate office. Mm -hmm. It's the same skill set. We just haven't created the right pathways. And so I think you'll see very creative ways in which companies will skill, reskill, apprentice, different career paths. The other thing that we've put in place is video interviewing as an example. How do you make it so easy for a potential employee to get their name and their picture out there. That all those, I think, are great tweaks that put potential employees a little bit more in charge of the decisions they wanna make. Yeah, and it makes it a lot easier to engage with a lot of employees. You know, you don't have to fly everybody in for the first round interview. You can do Zoom or, or Teams or something. Completely, and it's not, pay is imperative. And it is, for me, it's like the baseline imperative. I think you're also seeing companies think deeply about what else can I provide 
that will keep an employee sticky. So benefits, like in our case, paid caregiver leave. We have part time. Uh, we have paid time off for part time employees. Mm. Um, we have benefits like we use a company called Wealthy that will actually help you behind the scenes plan care if you're caregiving for a parent or an adult. We have tuition reimbursement. It's, I, I also like this real creative approach because you also have to have a real environment of engagement and belonging at your company because you can get someone in and pay yeah. them, but that doesn't mean they'll, they'll stay and want to go the extra mile. And so I also love creatively what I'm watching companies do to ensure they have the right benefits and infrastructure in place. So let me just sum up though, because I want to shift to supply chains. Sure. On the labor market side, it sounds to me like the world we're in now, you're expecting to sustain for the foreseeable future. It's not as though there's going to be some big wave of new workers that relieves, relieves all this pressure. Yeah, I just I just don't see it. And it's because the underlying factors are are so diverse. It's, right. I think, it, you know, if I were, my guess is what I would say out loud is it's a good 12 to 24 months of churn through our labor markets. Right. Okay, let's turn to supply chain. So we hear about supply chain challenges all the time. Mm -hmm. I've talked to a number of large companies uh, headquartered in our region, and they've said, hey, these supply chains don't seem like they're getting better. That some companies have said, we're big and global, we always have supply chain issues, but now we have 10 times as many supply chain issues as normal. And the moment we jump on one fire and put it out, something else springs up here. You have a thousand stores, I think. Yep. Uh, but you obviously source your products globally. Yep. So I'm just curious, how are you seeing supply chains? <laughs> well, we could do this for the next half hour. <laughs> um, supply chain, like so many things in the pandemic, is a layered crisis. There are many different things happening in the supply chain that are causing the issue, Aaron. So the interesting thing about consumer electronics is we've been dealing with supply chain issues for the better part of two years now because our products were some of the first that people really needed, right. high, high demand, and that, that was the first Thing that is causing this issue, that spike in demand that you're seeing. And it's hit different industries at different times, but it's this like really rapid, unexpected spike in demand. The second thing that happened, this next layer of the crises, is that it went really strongly toward goods, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody shifted away from yep. doing anything. We aren't flying anymore and shifted right into, I want to buy stuff. The third layer of the crises is, especially in our case in consumer electronics, you can only manufacture at scale so fast. Mm -hmm. like these are complex products that you're pushing through very large manufacturing plants in other countries, to your point. And so you can only catch that curve so quickly that, I mean, facilities are only built to, this is a little bit different than food. Like what we're putting together here takes some time. Yeah. Then the kind of fourth layer of the crises is um, labor is inconsistent. Mm -hmm in every country, right? Every country is taking their own approach to trying to mitigate the spread of the virus. And that means regions might shut down. That means um, you might have high call out rates. So you've got that problem in terms of manufacturing. And then that stretches into the ports, mm -hmm. not just here, but again, in other countries. Can you keep the ports going at 24 seven when you maybe have employees who might be there or might not be there? And at these new higher sustained volumes, can you even move enough product through the ports? And again, especially here in the US where we're less automated than some of the other countries. Mm -hmm. Layer on top of that, some of what you talked about, which is shortage of long haul trucking, and in some cases just shortage of trucks. Mm -hmm. Just We just don't have enough infrastructure to handle the quantity of goods that we're trying to move around this country at this point. And because the pandemic itself has been so volatile, these peaks and valleys mean you're kind of constantly peaking and valleying in different industries at different times. And so this, the reason I feel like we can't get out of this is this inconsistency of especially the virus, because then the behaviors change and then you just see it happen again. So now we're talking again about empty shelves in especially grocery stores. Mm -hmm. And it's because you've seen, again, this massive peak and change in behavior, and you just can't catch it fast enough, especially when you have um, the, the virus causing labor problems as well. So as you look ahead in your business, are you anticipating, I mean, is, it just, is this the new normal for the next couple of years, or what do you think? So I think what, what's been good about consumer electronics, because it was one of the first, we have now had the chance for two years to try to plan for changing customer behaviors. And so as we went into holiday, we actually said we felt like we were in a pretty good inventory position. And we said we felt like throughout holiday, we would continue to be able to replenish. To your point, there's always going to be some level of issues. There's always like a, a hot phone or a gaming console. Sure. But for the most part, we said we're, we're getting the goods. And that um, 
I think that is because we've had that longer time frame to kind of plan and adjust to the consumer behaviors. We also have scale. We have a very diversified supply chain. We have many partners along the way. And this is another place where scale matters a great deal. I think though, writ large, these are going to be issues for us into the foreseeable future. Because again, think about where we are right this second. You have other countries that are dealing with outbreaks. They're shutting down either manufacturing or they're shutting down ports. Like we're back into that. And no matter where you're at in terms of product, that's going to have ripple effects for you as a, as any company who's consumer facing. So I don't I don't see this alleviating anytime soon, unfortunately. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Although you were asked about it on the news, so I feel like you should be answering this question, well, not me. <laughs> I mean, on the on the on the demand side, I feel like we have a lot of um, visibility into the boost of demand. You talked about it. You're right. In many cases, it's not simply that there are supply chain problems. It's the demand is so much higher than it had been historically. So even if even if there were no pandemic problems, it'd be hard for supply to match that demand. You got it. We have a lot of visibility into the path of demand because we can model out the path of fiscal stimulus. Yeah. Huge stimulus coming from the government is now, in economic terms, going to become a fiscal drag yep. as that uh, you know, runs its course. We also can estimate how much additional savings families have, mm -hmm. both because they weren't traveling, so they were saving more money, and because of the support from the government. And we can see that that's being spent down, especially amongst low-income families. They're having to spend that down. Yeah. So the demand side, I feel like we have a lot more visibility into. The supply side is the one where it's very hard for the reasons that you said. Yeah. And then many of your peers, uh, other CEOs have said, it's just, just less confidence in when things are going to go back to normal and whatever that normal ends up looking like yeah. is, is unclear. And then it is very related to the virus. You yeah. know, as if new variants, I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if Omicron was just the final variant? But, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, I'd never heard of Omicron. Omic when I first heard of it, I thought it was Omicron. Oh, yeah. Everybody, <laughs> everybody has said it wrong for six weeks now. Um, but so, you know, we'll see. But then that has profound implications for us at the Federal Reserve. Because if we had great confidence that these factors that were driving high inflation were, temp were in fact temporary, then we could probably say, you know what, we'll just let it run its course and it'll naturally revert. Right. But if some of these things look like they're going to be sustained, then there's the risk that it could become a self-fulfilling prophecy and high inflation changes inflation expectations and then uh, it leads to sustained high inflation. So I'm just curious on the inflation front and the pricing front, yeah. does Best Buy have a view of where prices are going? It's interesting. We, um, even heading into the holiday, we said in consumer electronics, we would expect it to start to get a bit more promotional because we felt pretty strongly we had a good supply position heading in. That's gonna be the biggest question is, and it's gonna move industry by industry. I was mm -hmm. just reading yesterday that meat, as an example, you've seen the inflation start to wane on the meat side of things because that supply has finally caught up to some of the demand that we're seeing. I think it's going to be very inconsistent and very different by industry. We had said even heading into next year, we would expect some of that competitive environment to come back into consumer electronics because at the time we were talking heading into holiday, we felt like you were going to start to see that supply even out heading into next year. The wild card a little bit for me now is Omicron mm -hmm. because what does that do to production and shipping especially in other countries. Mm -hmm. And does that get us back into the position of constrained inventory, which as you well know, that's what's gonna cause this, this um, inability to be as competitive as you might have been before. And I would guess, I mean, obviously consumer electronics is a huge market, but for me individually as a consumer, mm -hmm. I had to buy some monitors, I had to buy two cameras when we all shifted home. Yeah. I still have those, those yeah. still work. So I don't need to keep buying more cameras and more monitors. Right. I would imagine that some of that would be evening out. Yeah, definitely versus the very beginning of the pandemic. And there's kind of different stages that we've seen. The first was like panicked need-based buying. Yeah. I all of a sudden am stuck in my office. I just need a laptop, yeah. right? Um, the second phase was how do I complete that solution? So as I sat in my home office, um, I was like, oh, now I need a webcam and I'd like a better keyboard and my chair is not helpful and I need a desk that stands up, right? And I need you know, a little bit of music because I'm stuck in here all day. So we started to see people just complete those solutions. I need my kids to have a solution mm -hmm. like that. Um, that stretched on for quite a while. Then what has happened and what I think is a more sustainable impact of this is people started to use their homes as much more broad entertaining spaces. Mm. And we saw it 
even outside, people were buying more grills and outside speakers and outside TVs because that became an extension of the home, somewhere I could entertain. Mm. We saw people invest in that in-home theater experience. Kitchens became a huge investment area. And this idea of nesting at home, based on the behaviors that we're seeing, is sustaining into the future. And the home as the hub for um, wanting just a better, I mean, streaming content went up four times what it was pre-pandemic. Mm. And you can see it in how people digest movies. Yeah. Most movies are released simultaneously, big screen and small screen, or you're maybe waiting four to six weeks. Well, if that's true, I want a whole different home theater experience. And Connected Fitness, another great example. And so you're right, the panicked side of the buying is gone. But in consumer electronics, what's really interesting is these are products that always evolve. They always change. Mm -hmm. And I, I use the most uh, recent um, distribution of the iPad as an example. The newest iPad camera actually tracks you when you move. None of the others had done that. But because so many more people are using the video, they're upgrading that feature to make it more useful. And that's, that, that replacement cycle is actually, we're, we're starting to see that accelerate as well as people want to upgrade because there's useful features that actually matter in the world we're living in. I saw right before we walked in this room that this, some headline came out that um, consumer spending was down a little bit relative to expectations. I'm just curious, is that consistent with what you, you all have seen? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think the holiday period is always the hardest for any retailer to know exactly what's going to happen. We did have a hypothesis, though, that people were going to shop earlier. And, um, and we talked about it in October. We actually saw some pretty strong results. At that point, we have to remember, everyone was already nervous about supply chains. Mm -hmm. And so I think the consumer is behaving a little bit differently than maybe historically, because the consumer is well aware there are many of these um, issues in, in the uh, industry. And so I, it, you can't quite compare like time periods to time periods anymore. I think it's more about, again, being there for when the consumer wants you and making sure that you aren't overreacting at any given point to changing consumer behaviors. How do you all think about, because you know, the virus has affected uh, the global economy, mm -hmm. obviously, but it affects different parts of the country at different times. Yeah. So you, know, you talked about when we started this conversation that, you know, I remember how many days you said you made the decision and then every, every store went curbside, yeah. basically overnight. How have you been able to make those kind of adjustments given the regional flare-ups that the virus has shown? Some, you know, some people are like, oh, we're great. And then a month later, they're just Not on great. fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the other big, you asked me at the very beginning, the big learnings from yeah. this. One of the other big learnings is uh, push decisions down. Push as many decisions as possible and trust your leaders throughout the organization to make the right decision. And one of the things that we have done is really empowered our general managers in those thousand or so stores across the US and Canada to make the right decision based on what they're seeing in their location. And um, that has, within, you know, we have guidelines, whatever, there's sure. bumpers, but sure. at the end of the day, they are going to know how best they can run their store and how best they can keep, again, priority one, customers and employees safe. And while you're right, the first decisions needed to be made at scale, every decision since then has been made relative, because it's not just what's happening regionally, sometimes it's regional laws, right? right? What, what is mask requirements, vaccination requirements now in New York uh, for any employer, that's different than anywhere else in the country and has different ramifications on that workforce. And so I give our teams so much credit for constantly innovating at literally the store level to meet not just the requirements, but also um, to really deliver on that first promise of keeping people safe. Right. Great. Well, let's, sh let's shift gears. I mean, I think we could talk about labor force and supply chains for all, the whole morning. Let's, I know this is a passion of yours, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've done a lot of work at the Minneapolis Fed in terms of our own staff. Yeah. We do a lot of research on these areas. Uh, we have a series on racism in the economy that we are partnered with all of the other 11 Federal Reserve Banks that I'm very proud of. I'm just curious, you know, this is a big topic. Where do you all focus on this? Yeah, well, first, um, kudos to you and, and the work that you've been leading. Um, let me start with this. It has been proven time and again that businesses create more value over the long term when they have more diverse employees and leaders. It is proven. <laughs> and so that is always the place we start from. Our job is to create long-term value, and we have a better chance of doing that with the most diverse workforce and leadership team possible. 
And so we really think about it on three layers, which is our company, our community here, and we're based here in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and then our country, because we have such scale, we can actually influence. And um, if there's anything about this work that I would say, it's it, it, you can do work on all fronts. So at Best Buy, we talk a lot about a culture of belonging and really creating a place where everyone feels like they can bring their best selves to work. And I was, I was meeting with an expert who said Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Many of us learned about it. And that is, what are the different states of needs as a human? And they used to believe the base of that pyramid was like food and water. And what they have come to find is that it's actually a sense of belonging. Hmm. When do you feel least comfortable? When you walk into a room where you don't feel like you belong. And when do you feel most comfortable and probably contribute and chat? It's when you feel like you belong with someone. And so at Best Buy, we are working hard on our hiring goals. We have retention goals. We have development work that we're doing. Um, and we have a board that is incredibly diverse and is helping us in this work, 50% female and a third people of color. And so that we, we are really working hard to flow that all the way through the organization. But importantly, we also have made commitments on spending with BIPOC businesses. We committed to $1.2 billion in spend. Um, but what I'm most passionate about is pipelining talent into our large organizations. Sometimes you'll hear CEOs say, well, I'd like more diverse talent, but I, there's not enough talent. We hear, I hear it here in the Twin Cities sometimes. There's not enough talent here. There's plenty of talent here. There's plenty of talent. We just aren't pipelining it. And so we are investing in um, teen tech centers. We put teen tech centers into disadvantaged communities all over the US. And um, we have over 40 right now, and we've committed to having 100 by 2025. We outfit those with all the tech, um, everything from 3D printers to sound mixing um, to graphic design. And we partner with community organizations. Here in the Twin Cities, we have one with Hope Community as an example. And those community organizations know the kids. And we start in middle school, it's after school, they have mentors and coaches, and then we help them get familiar with that tech, it's access, which so many of the kids in these communities just won't have that access. And then on top of that, we're layering $44 million in scholarships to then help them with the certifications out of those teen tech centers, and then internships back into Best Buy or General Mills or Target or anyone else. Sure. <laughs> and this idea of more pointed pipelines that will help us bring in talent from our own communities mm -hmm. is, I think, for Best Buy and given what we do well, um, the most important work that we're doing right now in the space. That's great. Well, I'm just curious, you know, we've done, our scale is so much different than yours. So we have about 1,100 employees. So we're yep. tiny relative to Best Buy, but we've done a lot uh, to try to improve, uh, the, make our leadership team more diverse, make us reflect the community. We made a lot of progress, but I've learned a bunch of things along the way. Uh, so I'll give you an example. When I first started here, we said, oh, we're going to adopt the Rooney rule. We're going to make sure that we have at least one highly qualified woman and one highly qualified person of color in all of our searches. Uh, what I've come to conclude is the Rooney rule is nonsense. That, you know, just think of it, just do the math. If 25% of the Twin Cities is diverse, and we say, well, one out of five finalists is going to be a person of color, well, if they're all equally qualified, you're never going to get to 25%. So it's just like a, that was something that we went in and I thought it was a good faith thing. And I realized it's just nonsense. It, it's not going to move the needle. I'm just curious, as you've been on this journey, are there some things that you thought were going to be very promising that you did it and you got, well, that didn't work. Yeah, I, <laughs> I do work in the space wrong all the time. And um, I love what you just did, which is you said out loud, I had this hypothesis and it didn't work out. I actually am going to give you a little bit of a corollary, which is there's something that worked so well that I, I, I didn't give really any thought to. When um, we were first really doubling down on this work, we came out publicly and said as a company, we had been doing work in the DE&I space, but we needed to do better. We had not done enough. And one of our employees came to me and said, I know you just want to start making commitments and like doubling down on things all over the place. Stop, boss, stop. Give us a little time to really digest and, and help you understand the problem and help you understand how the organization can be most helpful. And so we created a task force, which a lot of people did, I understand, of employees from across, um, across the country, across levels, and across backgrounds. And that task force spent real time learning about the history of racism in the US and the unique challenges that particularly our black employees were facing. And that cohort of people became, let's call it 40 people in our big organization who now have gone out and more organically, literally completely changed 
their organization. So one of them was one of our head merchants. He went back into the merchant organization and has now organically started to really change the composition and the engagement of that organization. The power of organic movement in this space, not just dictated rules, right. but organic belief and heart, that's what starts to move the needle. And I was chatting uh, with one of our black employees who leads a lot of our social impact work, and she said, it's like a snowball. It starts tiny, like our snowball was marble sized, and it takes a while to gain momentum going down the hill. But this, this real organic dedication to everything from how we engage to how we market to where we invest in our community, all of those things matter. And it can't just be the CEO, who cares? It has to organically permeate the organization. And when you look, given your huge footprint and your 100,000 employees, uh, obviously the Twin Cities has been a, a epicenter of racial tension. And Minnesota, we've discussed this previously, some of the worst economic and education disparities in the country. Yeah. But obviously you have a national footprint. So I'm just curious, do you see regions that you say, wow, they are really doing a good job in making progress in these areas that we in, the, in this region could learn from? Yeah, we are doubling down actually in Los Angeles. So Los Angeles is interesting because they have some of the same disparities that we do. Um, and yet you have a, a thriving um, entertainment industry who is really looking for more diverse talent throughout the internet. And we don't even think about the jobs that exist in entertainment. It's all the behind the scenes stuff. It's the cameras and the sound and the wiring of um, football stadiums. I mean, there's like all these jobs. And so we are engaging in a public-private partnership. We are uh, doubling down with a 10 to $12 million investment in LA, where we're going to put 12 teen tech centers and really saturate the market. And um, by doing that, more overtly create those pipelines. And so we're partnering with everyone from the, the electric unions that might be out there, all the way to um, some of the, the local governments who are allocating funds through some of the infrastructure programs to actually, in partnership with the local government, in partnership with local industry, create very dedicated pipelines and certifications potentially mm. into these roles. I think that's, that's what good will look like, is an engagement between local government, private partnerships like us, likely foundations who are also mm. looking for ways to invest, and then real output on the other side into industry. And if I, I, I just believe if you can create that real dedicated pipeline, you can change the composition of your, your local community. Yeah. And that's, I feel like here, so much of what we need is this constant engagement between all of these vectors in order to actually move the dial. And I would also think, I mean, Best Buy, given your retail, your huge retail presence, I mean, one of the, um, one of the challenges that I've found when I go out to schools, mm -hmm. uh, especially in low-income communities, is a lot of times the kids can't see themselves in whatever it is you do, yeah. right? I mean, they look at me and they say, you wear a suit, I don't know what it is the Federal Reserve does, you yeah. know, hard to picture myself there. Yeah. But they all can go into a Best Buy store and they can engage with the folks that work in Best Buy stores. So I mean, in some sense, that is a, an easy, maybe an easier path for people to say, hey, I can see myself joining this company. Maybe I don't want to be in retail in the storefront for my whole career, yep. but it's a place to start. Yep. What's interesting is um, even then, I think many of our associates can't see their full career path. Mm -hmm. So we, so many people start in retail and they're like, ah, I'm just going to do part-time or seasonal for um, a year and then I'll go do my next thing. And what we're finding is we even have the opportunity to help people understand what this path could look like. About 75% of our general managers, these are people running... 30, 40, 50, maybe the biggest stores, you know, $90 million stores, huge businesses. 75% um, started as part-time, hmm. occasional, seasonal. And they, they would tell you, they just thought they'd come in and have a job for a few months. And our ability to help people understand retail is not just about an hourly workforce. Retail is about careers. And they can be careers that take you to store leadership. They can be careers now, especially with a remote world, that could take you to really interesting corporate jobs. So that's one side. The second side, though, is um, we really work to embrace each individual's purpose at Best Buy. So at Best Buy, we talk a lot about purpose. We believe our purpose is to enrich lives through technology. Not a tagline. Genuinely. Why do we get the right to exist on the planet? And we find there's real power when people can connect their individual purpose to that of the company. 
it doesn't always mean they're going to have a full long scale career. I love going to stores and chatting with some of our associates and full on asking them, well, why are you at Best Buy? Well, I'm hoping for three years to earn enough money to get my degree to, you know, take my career. I, I was just chatting with the young woman who wanted to go teach. And I said, please, please go teach. Please leave this company and go teach. And um, I think embracing whatever the purpose is of each individual is a big part of what attracts people to the company and then ultimately retains them longer than they think is going to be the case. Interesting. I think um, it is, you're getting at something which is the sense of mission and sense of purpose. And so one of the things that's common at the Federal Reserve, not just the Minneapolis Fed, but all the Feds, yeah. is people do that. They come here, they all be here for two or three years. And then before you know it, they're here for 20 years. And I do think that there's something about the sense of purpose and sense of mission which keeps people engaged yeah. uh, in the work. I think especially now, back to our conversation around living for the last two years in a pandemic, um, if I'm gonna continue to put in this kind of work and, and now I have lots of choices about where I would like to work, I sure want to feel like there's a bigger purpose here than just making money. There's got to be something that's bigger. And it's also why we continue to stay engaged in DE&I. And in our case, we, we stay very engaged in climate and how we can impact uh, climate because our employees care. And they actually, frankly, will demand it of us. And that's a that's kind of a lovely situation to be in. So I'm curious, you mentioned climate. Um, I mean, it's, it's obviously a huge, complicated topic. I'm just curious, you know, what is the best buy? How do you think about climate and your role? Yeah, there's there's kind of two legs here. The first is we have we were one of the first to sign the climate pledge along with Amazon and a, a couple other retailers. And we just announced here in the last uh, three months that we were uh, aligning with certain retailers, Walmart being one of them, um, to get to zero carbon, be carbon neutral by 2040. And we are well on our way. We've reduced our carbon emissions um, just over 70 percent since we started this journey in 2009. And so that's everything from how our stores run all the way through to how we can contribute back into the grid. We have solar fields as an example. Um, so that is more about like our operations. Interesting about CE, there's a very circular economy in consumer electronics, right? These are products that are made up of lots of different parts and pieces from all over the world. And it's not just about when you purchase that, it's on the other side, we are the largest recycler. We've recycled 2 billion pounds of electronics. We repair and keep products active in the ecosystem. We have outlets where you can come and get maybe slightly damaged or lightly used products. We take our responsibility incredibly highly in consumer electronics in particular. Um, we, we don't want things to just go back into the landfills. We are repurposing as much as humanly possible and using that circular economy to make sure um, we're, we're fulfilling our role. And it's a very unique role. It's very different than apparel or some of the other, this is a very unique set of equipment. Yeah, I will say just as a, as a, as a customer, um, you know, recycling consumer electronics is, it's helpful that there's a Best Buy that you know you can go to uh, because otherwise, you know, this stuff piles up in your garage and it's like, what do I do with it? Right, and, and in many cases, it contains parts and pieces that you don't want to go right back into landfills. Yeah. And the nice part is um, we built this capability over time. So much of what we get back um, in the recycling, we are actually harvesting parts and pieces that we then can use in our repair business or we then can distribute to other um, repair agencies who would like those parts and pieces. Mm. Or in some cases, there are other um, areas of the country or even other countries who are interested in some of the refurbished product that we have. So mm. it's, it is an incredibly complex piece of what we do and we take it very seriously. Interesting. So we've talked about the labor market, we've talked about supply chains, we've talked about uh, diversity, a little bit on climate. Are there any other big initiatives that you're focused on with your colleagues at Best Buy? I think what's interesting about consumer electronics is that it is always disrupting our lives. I'd like to say positively, but it's always changing. And one of the spaces where we see consumer electronics really impacting us is in health hmm. and in how we care for ourselves, right? Um, it's more than just the wearables that both of us have on, which will tell us you know, how stressed <laughs> out we are on any given day. It is, think about connected fitness at home. It is baby. We sell an outlet sock that you put on your baby and if for any reason heart rate changes, pulse ox changes, breathing changes, it will alert you. So no more the like army crawling in to check in the crib to see if, you know, I, like I used to see if my baby's <laughs> still breathing. It literally will, we've had an employee who literally saved their baby's life because the alert went off. Wow. All the way up to as we age now in our homes, there is technology that can be incredibly helpful. 
um, blood pressure monitoring, heart rate monitoring. There are actually homes that are now being built with sensors in the walls, especially in assisted care facilities that can tell you if someone has fallen, they can tell you heart rate and, and temperature. Um, this idea of more consistently monitoring our health, not just at events, right? We go to doctors for events. Right. This consistent monitoring of our health over time and virtual care will be the next bastion of healthcare. And that is a big initiative that we are investing in at Best Buy because we just believe, again, uniquely, we understand technology and technology in people's homes in particular. And we, uh, we know that we have a role to play in where healthcare is going. Well, this is great. Well, Corey, I wanna thank you. You know, you've been a great resource for us when something's happening uh, that, that's surprising the global economy. It's great. You know, one of the things that's nice about being in the Twin Cities is we have some really wonderful global companies that we can tap into just to give us some insight. I mean, when the pandemic first broke out, I called some of our colleagues or other companies that have big operations in China. And I just said, tell us what your employees are seeing in China. How are you handling this? Uh, and you've also been a great resource for us to think about the consumer side of things. So really appreciate the partnership. Appreciate you coming here today and sharing your thoughts. Uh, I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleagues who are gonna uh, take the conference forward. So thank you again, Corey. Oh, thank you, it was lovely. I appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, Corey. What a wonderful conversation that was. Uh, just fantastic. I'm glad we have it on recording because I think that's something that needs to be shared really widely. So really appreciate the conversation. I think we could have had even more of that, but we do have to move on. So I'm gonna be responsible for uh, taking us to the second portion of the uh, of the conference here. I'm going to share my screen here real quickly. And I'm going to give a short presentation to give a little bit more background, some things that Neil actually touched on, and to give us a, a little bit of a, a, a tea to set up some of the discussions for the panels that we're going to have here shortly. So the second portion of this conference is really going to be a discussion about inclusiveness and equity and how it relates to the pandemic recovery. And actually, before I get started, actually, I should introduce myself. My name is Ron Wirtz, and I'm Regional Outreach Director at the Minneapolis Fed. So I'm one of several people that help Neil understand what's happening kind of in the real economy and the real time economy. And so we do a lot of outreach to business. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the evolution of that outreach. We're gonna have two panels today, but both are gonna be get kicked off by brief presentations by Minneapolis Fed staff, myself being one of them, and Eric Garcia Luno being the second one. What we're gonna do is we're gonna give some background on current Minneapolis Fed initiatives related to workers and to minority and women-owned business enterprises. And that will provide the context for both of the panel discussions that will follow the presentations themselves. But to start, we're also going to give a brief overview of the pandemic recovery among M uh, MWBEs to help tee up that first panel. And that will be my responsibility. Before I get into some of the more some of the uh, content that I'm going to present, I have to give you my disclaimer. So the views expressed here are the are mine and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis or the Federal Reserve System. So first, let me give you a little background on economic intelligence gathering at the Minneapolis Fed. So I think people are pretty familiar with the fact that the Federal Reserve tracks current economic conditions for the purposes of setting monetary policy. And as Neil mentioned earlier, we have this dual mandate from Congress regarding monetary policy. So when we think about monetary policy and changes to that regime, we're thinking about creating a stable price environment and we're trying to maximize employment. Now, I'm not gonna be able to talk a lot about really any of the concepts and other things that I'm gonna present here. This really just kind of a broad overview. Um, but what I wanted to, I wanted to mention that because when we're tracking economic conditions, we have historically sought out information from firms and especially large firms. And there is some utility to doing that actually. It offers a pretty good snapshot of aggregate activity, <clears throat> excuse me. So in talking to large firms, they represent a significant portion of the overall economy. So we can get a good idea of aggregate activity. It also offers insights across geography. So I can tell if things in Minnesota are performing differently than say South Dakota. It also gives us insight to industry sectors like how manufacturing is performing relative to construction or agriculture or services. But that large firm approach also has some blind spots to it. The first one is in minority and women owned business enterprises. And the reason there are several reasons why, but one of the most fundamental is that MWBEs tend to be smaller operations. So we are, we just, they don't reach the net quite as often, at least historically. 
We also know that we have a blind spot as it relates to workers. And that's that we've kind of come to realize that because labor markets are we're viewing those mostly through the eyes of firms or demand and not workers, which is the supply part. And that's particularly relevant now, given our current labor force participation trends, which have been which have fallen during the pandemic. So we are specifically doing more outreach to these groups. And it really is an outgrowth of the bank's long running diversity and inclusion efforts. I don't know if folks are familiar with the racism and economy series. It was it has been a more than a year long effort by the Federal Reserve System, kind of kicked off by the Minneapolis Fed to really investigate issues related to racism and the economy. Who's who's recovering and who's not during the during the pandemic? If you're not familiar, I would greatly uh, encourage everyone to just Google it and and see. I believe there are a half dozen or more um, sessions on that that are just really fantastic. And not all of these efforts are new, but what I would say is they are expanded, they're more intentional, and they're more public. And I'll talk a little bit about that. First, I want to talk about the why and the how. So the biggest reason for the Minneapolis Fed wanting to do that is we want to make the bank and monetary policy a lot smarter about the current about current economic conditions and really who is and who is not recovering from the pandemic. There's also kind of a secondary goal because we get a lot of uh, attention from the public, from the media. We really want to make those stakeholders more aware of those additional voices and stakeholders and how they are performing during the pandemic. And now these new voices, kind of a real tangible outcome for these new efforts is that they are now officially reflected in the Beige Book. I don't expect everyone to necessarily know what the Beige Book is. It is a, um, uh, it is a, report that is published eight times a year in conjunction with FOMC meetings. You might not be, uh, you might not read it yourself. I would call it a um, uh, an acquired taste maybe, but it is followed very closely by economy watchers, including the media. And we think it really publicly demonstrates the Minneapolis Fed and the system's efforts to be more inclusive regarding, regarding the pandemic's effects and who is recovering during the pandemic. And I just wanted to give you a really quick snapshot, visual snapshot of our commitment to these particular areas. So this is a copy of um, the very first page book that included these new sections that are highlighted in light blue. Previous to this, you would have only seen the sections that are that are represented there, employment and wages and some sector um, uh, sections as well. But in February of, of 2021, we added for the first time these two particular sex sections on worker experience and minority and women owned business enterprises. They remain a, a very vital part of our beige book. They will continue going forward. I think the good news there too is that we've also helped convince other uh, district banks to continue uh, to work on this themselves so we get it kind of nationwide more more visibility to these particular issues. So that's a little bit of background on kind of where we are with some of these initiatives and it really is the focus of the next two panels. So what we're going to do is briefly provide some information about what the Minneapolis Fed has been learning about MWBEs and workers during the pandemic. And again, what we're hoping is that that will tee up some of the discussion um, among the local experts and practi practitioners that we've gathered from around the district that are going to talk about the unique challenges faced by MW MWBEs and workers during the pandemic. So first up is the MWBE panel, and I'm going to give you a little background on that. So in terms of, of the pandemic, we've done a lot of surveys that have helped us identify what's happening with MWBEs. We do a quarterly general business survey that um, is really that has really helped us identify the MWB component. We have a special question that helps people uh, firms self-identify. And um, our response size in those two categories, minority owned businesses and women owned businesses are roughly um, in the ballpark of what you would see in the economy overall. So we're pretty happy with that. What I would say though, is because of our sampling process, I would say this is a good snapshot of conditions, but it is not a scientific sample. So I'm gonna show you some data. I'd like you to interpret it cautiously. I would call it more of a guide for general trends than it is for specific outcomes. So one of the ways we were wondering, especially early in the pandemic about how our MWBE is performing, especially relative to the overall economy, we had a really good measure early on when the, when the PPP program came in to help uh, businesses get through the early portion of the pandemic. 
So we asked in the general business survey about whether they had applied for emergency government aid, whether they had found a lender and whether they had received funding. And as these charts show, we generally see a lessening or a, um, a bigger gap between minor, especially minority owned firms and those other firms in the economy. So uh, they found they were less likely to find a lender and they were even less likely than that to have received actual funding in emergency aid. We also ask about revenues because we're really interested in trend lines. Um, and one of the things that we have found is that the share of uh, re respondents reporting negative quarterly revenues generally has been higher among MWBEs as compared to all other firms. Um, one of the things I also wanted to show is that particularly in areas where the economy saw more growth, you didn't see the same reaction among MWBE firms as all other firms. Um, particularly in the third quarter of 2020, which saw strong growth, and then the first half of this year. Now, I do need to point out there are there are some um, uh, there are a number of factors that I think we have to kind of keep at least in the back of our head. And respondent composition probably plays some role here. More MWBEs are small businesses, and we know that small businesses um, over the course of the pandemic have suffered a, a harsher fate than large firms. We also know that more MWBEs, more minority businesses in particular, are located in Minneapolis, excuse me, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And they also had more restrictions on operations, particularly among service uh, kinds of organizations, um, restaurants, other kinds of crowd oriented or consumer oriented businesses, and they have seen a larger effect as well. So why exactly um, we're seeing these differing um, uh, performances, there's a lot of reasons why those are probably some of them. We also asked about um, the challenges. We asked all firms what kinds of challenges they were experiencing and which ones really rise to the top. So we asked respondents to essentially say, what were your two top ch operational challenges? And not surprisingly, labor availability is one of those. But what we did see is that MWBEs are having significant difficulties finding labor, but somewhat less difficulty than businesses overall. I think probably at least one reason for that is the fact that they didn't see the same revenue, tr positive revenue trends. So if you're not you're, if you're not as busy, you're not likely looking for labor as much as firms that are growing faster. Another thing that that Ms. Barry and Neil were talking about supply chains, I think it's a really high profile kind of topic right now. And there's kind of a good news, bad news, although I don't know which how, how you might actually characterize which one is which. So through much of the pandemic, there was a lower share of MWEs that were having supply chain problems. Again, I think lower revenue trends probably are a factor. If you look to the very right of the chart though, the most recent survey that we have, MWBEs in terms of supply chain problems have caught up. I don't think that's necessarily good news, except I think it maybe is an indicator that maybe things are picking up a little bit for MWBE firms, and that would be good news. So I think I'm just about wrapping up here. I think one of my last charts here is that um, we also asked them uh, among the different factors that we asked them, whether it's challenging is our prices and CapEx. We know that prices have risen. We know that's a challenge for lots of businesses, really all businesses. But the share that saw it as the, one of the top two challenges, we see that um, M MWBEs are seeing somewhat higher price pressure. They seem to have um, they seem to have evened out a little bit more in the most recent survey. And I should note, we actually have a survey in the field right now. Unfortunately, we don't have enough um, responses to actually include them here. Um, we, it looks like they're moderating a little bit. I would hope that continues. But the other thing I would point you to the left chart is that there is a fairly significant difference between um, MWBE firms and, and all other firms as it relates to CapEx. CapEx being really important in terms of being able to invest in your business. It really is a sign of confidence going forward about your business. And we are seeing what I think are pretty notable uh, differences in, in, in that uh, question itself. So in summary, um, MWBE performance during the pandemic really has lagged that of businesses overall. And I think the point here is that it has lots of spillover effects, effects that I think our panel is gonna talk about itself. So that is the end of my formal presentation here. And I'm gonna hand it over to Joe Mann to take us into the panel portion of this, conf of this conference. Thank you very much. 
All right. Thanks, Ron, uh, for a, a very nice summary of a lot of the work that we've been doing over the, uh, the last couple of years. Um, we're going to turn it over now to our first panel discussion this morning. We have some folks from across the 9th District uh, to talk about the, uh, their experiences and the experiences of, their, uh, of, of, of folks in their networks. Um, <clears throat> by the way, I'm Joe Mann. I'll be moderating our two panel discussions this morning. I'm one of our regional outreach directors, and I, along with Ron and Eric Garcia Luna, monitor conditions in our region uh, for, for the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. So I'm just going to go around uh, the horn real quick here and have our, our first set of panelists introduce themselves. And uh, I, think I'll, I think I'll take it in alphabetical order. So I'm going to start with uh, Emmanuel, if you could introduce yourself to our audience, please. Hey, um, everybody. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Bassey, and um, I live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, and um, I own an Allstate insurance agency, and um, I own another media company. Um, so um, I felt that, that this would be helpful to give you guys a little bit of insight um, in the, from the perspective of a business owner slash minority um, business owner as well. So... Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, Macy, if you could introduce yourself, please. Good morning, everybody. I'm Macy Hur. I'm the CEO of the Mung Wisconsin Chamber of Commerce. We are a statewide organization uh, that uh, primarily focuses on uplifting economically underserved um, communities. We are a CDFI, a community development financial institution here in the state, and we are headquartered in Milwaukee, but we have two satellite offices in Wassa as well as in Madison at this time. And uh, uh, we do two primary things. We uh, provide technical assistance of all different kinds and also the opportunity to for um, our clients to apply for lending dollars. All right, thank you. And I should mention that Macy's organization covers all of Wisconsin. And yes. uh, while the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis's district only covers part of Wisconsin, we're more than more than interested in hearing uh, hearing the uh, information from the the less important parts of Wisconsin. <laughs> I kid. Um, and, uh, and last, uh, if I could, uh, if I could have, uh, you introduce yourself, uh, to the audience, please, Mike. Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Maben. I'm a serial entrepreneur and small business junkie. I, I, uh, get a kick out of starting and, and growing businesses, small businesses in particular, my own and, and others. I currently serve as the owner of a handful of businesses that uh, range anywhere from two to 20 employees. I've got a business called Shutter Pilots that does aerial photography. Innovator does augmented reality products. Uh, Pemmican Patty Food Company does beef and bison jerky. And then I also have my main company is Agency Mabu, which is a marketing and advertising company um, headquartered in, in North Dakota. Um, I didn't start my first business until I was in my mid 40s. And so I've been working the past 20 years fast and feverishly to kind of catch up on doing all the things that, that I'm passionate about. I'm a citizen of the uh, Little Shell Tribe, uh, Chippewa Indians of Montana. And so a lot of my business interests um, really focus on building Native American culture and supporting economic development um, in small business, especially for entrepreneurship in Indian country. And I'd also like to mention that Mike is currently a member of our Ninth District Advisory Council uh, that joins us at the bank twice a year uh, to report on economic conditions around the region. So thank you for, for serving on that. Um, and that's a, that's a notification to anybody in the audience that are, if you're interested in uh, potentially serving on one of our advisory councils in the future, uh, please, uh, please let us know. And we're always, we're always interested in new candidates for those. Um, <clears throat> Uh, before I get started with the uh, with the questions, I do want to point out to the audience that they uh, that they do have the opportunity to ask questions to this panel through the Q and A feature in uh, in this Zoom session. Uh, I'll be monitoring that and uh, and, uh, and and picking out questions to uh, to forward along uh, in this discussion as well. But I want to kick us off. Um, <clears throat> it seems like uh, it seems like, of course, over the last couple of years, everything is is pandemic, uh, pandemic, pandemic. Um, and I know that you all have a lot to say about the impact that the pandemic has had on your own experiences and those in your network. Um, uh, Ron kind of set us up nicely to talk about what we've been hearing through some of our survey work uh, from minority and women-owned businesses. Uh, but in particular, I think one thing that's interesting that we've heard a lot about 
more anecdotally is the experience that uh, that that minority and women owned firms have had accessing some of the pandemic relief funds. And I wonder if you could share uh, some of your experience with that. And Macy, since you represent uh, a, a lot of businesses um, and you're very much kind of at the as a CDFI uh, very closely involved with that, I wonder if you might be able to, to kick us off. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, a lot of what we saw, um, I would say, right when we started, the businesses started to, it was required of the businesses to start, start to shut down. Uh, we saw a lot of panic in the community, of course, just across the board. And um, we saw that a lot of businesses that typically don't reach out to us and need our services. Uh, and, and I would say, first of all, I should back up a little bit and say, a lot of the businesses that tend to come to us are business startups, new entrepreneurs who don't have access to traditional uh, financial institutions, or they tend to be underbanked. They are considered, um, um, high risk by uh, many traditional banks. And as a result, they come to us uh, for assistance. And we use a broader measure to determine their eligibility for lending dollars, for example. Um, and then we provide them technical assistance to make sure they're successful. So before I answer that, Joe, really quickly, is that because of the services we're able to provide, we have a nearly 0% default rate of payback um, from our um, for those who lend from us. Um, so let me just or borrow from us, I should say. So with that, um, many businesses that haven't needed our services, we found them coming to us. They were some of the first ones at our door saying, well, we haven't needed you before, um, but we need you now. And what are, what can you do to help us? But some of the, um, and then unfortunately, we were not able to help some of those businesses right away because again, our dollars um, are geared towards particular populations because of the funding that we receive. Um, and then also, the, um, and, and that bothered me. We, I decided it was important for us to, to create a product um, that not only our current members could take advantage of, but those who typically have not come to us um, could take advantage of too. So actually our chamber was actually one of the first to create a relief fund of sorts for these businesses so they could take advantage of that. Um, so we did that. There are others who, um, we typically, uh, who typically come to us. Those were unfortunately the ones who didn't receive the funding that, they, that we would have liked to see them receive. We were trying to get out as far as we possibly could, reach as far as we possibly could, our team of six. Um, and yet at the same time, we found those were the businesses who struggled to get the dollars um, that became available through the government, through our offices. They would come to us maybe two weeks later and say, you know, once the money was gone. Um, uh, so we heard that you have money or do you know of money? And I would say, I, I'm unfortunately, we've been trying to reach out to businesses just like yours. And now the money's gone. We suspect there's going to be more, um, but we're, it, we don't know when. So that was happening a lot. A lot of that due to a lot of, I, I would say, an overload of information, um, them not having access, uh, as much access to the banks, and then language barriers. Um, I would say that that was a huge part too. There's a lot of pride um, in many of these business owners, you know, it took them a lot to build their businesses and then to have to come to someone for services um, was was something that was really difficult for them. Surprisingly, compared to those who typically, may, uh, you know, are very successful, they were the first ones knocking on the doors and saying, hey, where's my money? <laughs> so that that was an interesting thing that we saw. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um... <clears throat> Mike, I know in addition to your own uh, businesses, you also uh, have a lot of clients who may have shared their experience with you. And I'm wondering if you can kind of talk, uh, talk about what you've, what you've seen over the pandemic with, with regard sure. to the effectiveness and availability of those funds. Sure. And I think that I, I liken it to the uh, vulnerabilities that we as individuals have to the pandemic from a health standpoint. The same applies from a business standpoint. And so the pandemic seems to have affected everyone uniquely, even within same industries. Um, but in terms of my perspective, a lot of the, the clients that we work with, um, some are uh, reservation based and, and many are, are off reservation. But to that, um, just having the connections with uh, traditional banking financial institutions that had access to the SBA loan program was a problem. Um, many um, participate in you know, native CDFI um, programs, um, credit unions, small banks, not necessarily aligned with the larger, more established um, financial institutions. And so 
in many cases, there were the, the financial institutions that they were aligned with didn't have the access to the SBA um, loan programs. And in, in the case of North Dakota, we're fortunate that we're one, uh, we're the only state, I believe, that has a state-owned bank. And uh, the Bank of North Dakota, uh, I have to give them tremendous kudos because they immediately stepped in. They reached out to the small banks and the credit unions, and um, they provided them a, some sort of um, letter of uh, memorandum of understanding that enabled that those financial institutions to have access to the SBA loan program. And that's how I and others that I'm aware of were able to, um, to ultimately access the funds, but timing was everything. And so if you weren't on it right away, it seemed like you kind of missed out. And so um, I think just having connections with the institutions that were already connected was a challenge for many of the organizations that I'm familiar with. Manuel, is that what you were seeing in Sioux Falls in terms of the importance of uh, timing and connections? Um, connections definitely played a big factor and it made me realize firsthand that um, small business is hard to be fully recognized um, because um, I didn't think of myself as a small business until I, until I reached that point. Um, it was, it was just the fact of um, as an all-state agency, um, we were forced to um, we're forced to um, do our banking with Wells Fargo, and so I just felt that we had good reach with everything that we did. We had the resources, um, and so me as an agency owner, when I was trying to utilize um, monies given by the government um, and enacted by the banks, um, I I just thought that we would be able to um, get some sort of um, you know, we'd get, get help quickly. And so um, I learned that firsthand by having my application ready in hand, waiting until the Monday that they said that everything was gonna be ready. And, um, and when I went in to apply early in the morning, uh, they said the funds had run out. And um, then just realizing from the back channeling um, of my resources and some of the people that I've, I've had um, uh, community involvement with, realized that a lot of big businesses um, had already gotten the go ahead in the, the weekend during the weekend. Um, and um, they had pretty much put everything that they felt that was in place um, first uh, ahead of um, other businesses. So they, they looked at, um, I guess, in essence, they were looking at who, who was most to, um, to benefit in terms of big business with bigger employer employee um, counts and things like that. Um, so that was definitely, um, it was definitely hard. And I mean, it was hurting everyone's pocketbooks, uh, you know, especially business owners uh, when the pand pandemic occurred um, because me as a business owner, I had to shut our doors open very early just because um, we were receiving a lot of clients that are coming in to make cash payments. That's almost similar to what a bank would do. And so I was seeing that um, tele, um, uh, drive through banking, um, those sort of, of clerks were the ones that were hit the hardest with COVID because they were handling paper money. And so um, I definitely shut down our agency very quickly. I think in March, um, mid-March was when I shut down our agency. And then I had to deploy other tactics to figure out how to, to put my workers remotely. So. You know, Manuel, you hit on something that I wanted to ask about, which is the payments question and, uh, and the effect of that. But in particular, more broadly, um, the, the ways in which businesses had to pivot uh, in response to the, the first wave of the pandemic. And you already mentioned the cash payments and how a lot of businesses uh, that maybe weren't accustomed to electronic payments had to, had to make that transition quickly. But what sort, of, um, what sort of opportunities did that open up for you? And I'm going to turn it over to, 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 to Mike and Macy, too. But why don't we start with you? to talk about kind of the opportunities that you that you saw open up as a result of that. Well, when and with a pandemic like that, your back is to the wall, especially financially. So um, it, it definitely it made me dig, dig deep because um, I lost um, my entire life savings um, in a matter of two months just because of payroll costs and just our um, 
about 70, 75% to 80, 78% of, of, of our business revenue is from new business. And so when that was cut off, because no one was trying to get insurance during the pandemic, um, when that was cut off, I still had the same bills and I had the same employee count. And um, my issue was trying to figure out how to curtail the damage without um, spiting my face. <laughs> and um, so I was trying to figure out how to stop the blood loss um, in terms of, 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 of financial, financial um, um, losses. And um, eventually I pivoted in terms of uh, branded PPE equipment. And so um, I was selling that. And then of course I had to think outside the box because I really was in a hard spot. And so I ended up um, focusing on event insurance. And the reason why I did so was because I wasn't seeing any help from our, um, our mothership. And so I kind of did something sideways. Um, uh, I got, you know, obviously I got an okay with the state, but um, I had to, um, I, I, I created a partnership with another insurance company to sell event insurance. And even though events were canceled, a lot of people were thinking of this as an end of, end of times event. And so a lot of people were getting married. And so that was a great pivot for me um, financially, because then I saw that that seemed to help um, us in a, in, a, in, in, in a financial aspect um, prior to the PPP funds being, being, um, being um, accessible to us. And obviously I had to go outside of our Wells Fargo bank um, to another bank. Um, I'm not sure if I should name banks, but I mean, I went to US Bank um, and because my other business um, uses them primarily. And so that's why, that's why how we were able to get um, PPP money um, uh, fairly quickly. But obviously, sometimes it might just just um, you know a week could be the the differentiating differentiating factor between a business going under and a business being you know having some sort of legs to stand on. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that full circle back to the the funds question. It's really fascinating experience to share uh, with us, uh, Mike. What about you? What did how did you, how did you kind of have to pivot, and what sort of what sort of opportunities did you see open up? Well, I'll speak um, on behalf of my main company, which is a marketing and advertising company. And um, when the pandemic hit, you know, one of the first things that is a variable expense with many businesses is, is your marketing and advertising. And so we were hit very hard. Um, we immediately saw um, a 30% decrease in business. Well, we've got 20 employees. And uh, as a small business, we have some reserves, but not a lot to sustain yourself for for uh, very long without having, um, you know, your recurring revenue just because we're a service-based biz business. And so um, the first thing we did was we, uh, we looked at how we could use our, our excess capacity to give back. And so we reached out to our clients and uh, said, here we are. You know, we're available and we did a lot of pro bono work in the first uh, three or four months. And we work with a lot of nonprofits and tribal native organizations, and they're all working on shoestring budgets anyway. And so there was there was really a, a mutual value and benefit that we could find. And in, and in giving back, it was really um, a, a very empowering kind of thing for our team because we really realized um, the good that we could do with, you know, being communicators. And um, after a couple of months, we were able to um, secure uh, a PPP loan, which was ultimately forgiven, which enabled us to um, stay fully staffed throughout all of this. And um, we've actually grown um, two FTEs since the pandemic began. And um, so with that, the other thing that we did in terms of pivoting is we all were working remotely and um, we put systems in place for process improvement. And uh, it allowed us to realize that we can do what we do from wherever. And it, it enabled us to um, work remotely. Some um, of our team members now um, live elsewhere outside of our geographic area. And so it opened our eyes to talent recruitment and retention outside of our immediate community. 
Um, and it also opened our opportunities with clients outside of our, our region. And so we have, we've grown tremendously, not only in our talent pool and um, our access to talent, but also in our, in our, the clients we serve. Um, and so ultimately this has made us stronger. We've come out of this in a very good way. We improved our processes. We um, kind of contributed in a positive way through bro, pro bono and we were able to grow our client base um, throughout the, the US. Thank you. Uh, Macy, you, you work with a lot of different kinds of businesses and I'm wondering if there's any kind of general sort of, sort of trends you can sort of sum up in terms of what what, what types of opportunities have, uh, have uh, the businesses uh, that you work with been able to, to take advantage of during this period? You know, I think there are lots of pleasant surprises. Um, you know, I think there was a broad belief um, among my economic development leader colleagues across the state that um, perhaps our state was going around it the wrong way and giving out the funds, you know, starting with some of the most vulnerable cor- or, or businesses. Um, but what I saw was a lot of our businesses, um, some of these most vulnerable businesses were surviving, I think probably from what I could see at a higher rate than I think we thought they would. Um, they're highly resilient. Um, and yet, yet at the same time, their, their financial reserves or um, you know, margin for error is really small. Right. So they may have been doing very well prior to the pandemic. Um, and then they could they they were afraid they were going to have to shut down within a week or two of, of the pandemic. Um, it, they were lucky if they could say um, it, within a month they would have to shut down. Um, a lot of what I heard was within a, a week or two um, and they were really afraid. But many of them decided, you know, this is their livelihood. You know, they had to pivot some way, whether they wanted to or not. Many of them are. Um, you know, they have physical brick and mortar um, locations. They were able to pivot um, by having uh, moving to curbside. Those who understood how businesses work and were quite veteran um, and perhaps understand how the American um, economy works. And many of them were able to pivot to curbside, for example, um, and, they, and they did well. Um, they um, made sure they used social media to get the word out um, and marketing and, and, they, and they did well. Others who uh, were probably my most, was most surprising to me, but I love to see is they were able to move their businesses online. Um, Those who had language barriers, they realized, wow, not only there's a market online uh, where I can sell live, sell live and may, make a profit, in fact, even more so than my brick and mortar location. Um, so I saw much of that happening. Um, they, they didn't have to handle um, paper money um, that, you know, they could actually take payments online. So a lot of that was happening. If anything at all, I think they're having to deal now with what it means for their taxes, right? So um, I think that's the other challenge and perhaps that's for another discussion. Um, But I think that's, if anything, is the issue. Um, Many of them started their own businesses either because they had to be let go or they decided they saw other people um, starting new businesses and they thought they could do the same thing too. Um, And they could work from home. There's that flexibility. So we saw a lot of that happening. We were able to help also a lot of businesses for all the reasons that I just mentioned to you. Yeah, you just touched on something that was like, the next thing I wanted to ask about, actually, you know, we were talking about opportunities that are being uh, opened up for existing businesses, but I'm wondering what kind of trends you're seeing in entrepreneurship and, and folks starting new businesses. You know, there are those who op- are opening up, uh, well, a, a lot of uh, um, selling of food, um, selling of uh, clothing, beauty products, uh, a lot of that happening. Um, I would say a good majority of what I'm seeing are some of those products. Oh, I, I've also seen an uptick in those uh, moving into areas like real estate. Um, mm-hmm. That seems to be huge too. What about okay. you, Mike? Are you seeing? Yeah, yeah. Um, we have um, really expanded our freelance network, our independent contractors. We found a lot of people. Some of our our own um, staff have chosen to go an independent contractor route as well, and so we're finding that that is a a big part of our mix. Not only having flexibility in terms of help out part-time, you know, full-time, um, also adding the independent contractor and teaming relationships. So we've done a lot more collaboration. We've got, we've actually established a, uh, uh, an affiliated network with um, freelancers that we're inviting 
um, them in to join us such that we can find mutual benefit because one of the challenges of being an independent contractor is you're out on your own and you don't have the scalability and the, the scope of services, which we can help them get business by partnering. And then they can help us provide service to our clients in specialized way. And so we've found that um, the entrepreneur, you know, in people um, being a good thing for them and for us, because we can really collaborate with one another and find some mutual benefit together. Uh, Emmanuel, um, you've already talked a little bit about some of your own entrepreneurial activity, um, but I know you're a member of a number of, uh, of, of organizations within Sioux Falls and kind of wondering if you could kind of generalize a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of, uh, of, of entrepreneurship and startup activity in, uh, in, in your, in, within your network. Um, in terms of our network, um, there's been a myriad of jumpstarting um, events that, that did help spur that kind of development. One of them was during COVID. Um, I know I spoke, um, there were, there were, uh, there were, there was funding from the government, but also our state and our city actually reached out to gig workers um, and, and, and people suffering, business owners that were suffering or, or just personally for people who were suffering, suffering, and they, they had gave them, they put them through an application process. Um, the actual name of the, the additional assistance was through the One Sioux Falls Fund. And um, it was through, it was funded, it was a fund held at the Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation to help individuals and families impacted by COVID-19 and especially gig workers as well. And with, with rent payment assistance and, um, and, and just help during those lean times. So I know a lot of gig workers who pivoted into other things. Um, so, and when I say gig workers, there's a lot of different, there's a myriad of gig workers. I mean, we have musicians, we have, um, different things like that. So, um, and, and some of them, because they were part-time gig workers, they're also like part-time, um, restaurant, um, hosts and things like that. So there was like a double whammy in terms of some of the places affected. Um, but I've just seen a, a a big pivot in people's creativity because they realize that technology is the driving force of change. So because they're realizing that, that location is irrelative, they're starting to open up uh, new avenues and new opportunities for businesses. Um, they're realizing that, that talent and utilization of information is great even on a macro level between distance so that that way we can realize we're effective without actually being present physically. So um, I'm sure hospitality services suffered through this and will continue to su suffer because of the lack of conferences, in-person conferences and things like this. This would be in a, a perfect example of something like that. Um, but um, yeah, there's just been a lot of change. Uh, well, I have, I have a number of other uh, questions that I'd like to get to, but we're starting to get some questions from our audience. And so thanks to the audience members who've uh, who submitted questions through the Q&A feature. Um, and I'm going to uh, actually just, just go to one of those right now and kind of open it up to the floor. Were there advisors that stood out as more helpful in advising you through the pandemic, for example, bankers, attorneys, or CEA, CPAs, or was it, was it for you uh, more of a D DIY experience? Anyone want to weigh in on that? It was definitely a DIY experience for myself. Um, okay. So um, I put everything at the feet of my CPA um, mm -hmm. because I just felt that if I'm not, if, if, if I do not know something, I would rather, I, I like to seek information. And so I don't want to tackle something that I'm not equipped to tackle. However, whenever I was coming to them with questions about um, assistance or what impact this would have on, these were so, such uncharted territory that I couldn't even get that kind of um, help um, from my CPA. So I, every decision I made, I was writing down what I was doing so I could see the steps and then what the potential outcomes could be. Um, so I was making sure I, I saw, um, I, was, I was looking at the right resources. So sometimes it meant shopping around for information. Um, sometimes I'd go to the city, the chamber, 
um, for for um, our our local chamber for 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 explanation on on how to proceed with specific things. And um, sometimes I'd have to go to a bank. Um, the nice thing was because the banks were in, I'd say cahoots with the uh, the the um, um, the government, they knew where things were heading. So when I asked them, I would get more information from a banker who is working with loans specifically for businesses than I would from other entities. So everything was just a mix and match. I mean, you just had to figure out where you could go to for source. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, uh, change directions here real quick and and uh, and and uh, talk a little bit about. I want to talk a little about bit about something that uh, that that Neil and Corey spent a great deal of time uh, uh, on, which is the the labor market and uh, the sort of worker shortage that we're hearing about all over our region. Um, just want to know a little bit about how that's how that's affecting you and um, and, uh, and 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 whether or not whether or not you or those in your network have experienced that. Um, and what you see is kind of going on there, um, uh, whether it's whether you think it's likely to uh, to 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 be alleviated anytime soon, um, or whether this is kind of a new normal that you think we're we're operating in now. And I don't know who um, who wants to take it first. Maybe maybe Mike. Sure. Um, I, I don't know where to start there. I, I just think that you know the labor shortage is affecting everyone, and. Um, in, in our particular case, we've been fortunate to have um, full retention uh, of our team. If that weren't the case, we'd really be struggling because like I had mentioned, we've, we've grown by two FTEs, um, but that has been really difficult. I mean, we've really had to go out and um, advertise and um, proactively seek um, talent. And that's why we've done more on the freelance side, you know, building out a, an affiliated network, because I think that's going to be a trend that is going to be more aligned to, you know, building your, your talent pool. Um, we had an open position we were looking to fill about six months ago. Um, and um, we received two applicants. Um, and it wasn't because we didn't <laughs> go out and, and, and really push it on social and, and uh, paid with Indeed and all these other places, which we'd never had to do before. I mean, literally, I, pre-pandemic, much like the other story was, that was shared, um, would receive just unsolicited, hey, you have any job openings, you know, at least one or two um, a, a week. So there was always this ready pool. And so I agree with what Neil is saying, you know, that the pendulum may have been uh, too far to one side, but now it is. So I think that is going to come back somewhere in the middle, but we're also seeing trends. And I can just think anecdotally about uh, some of the, uh, the family, friends and, and colleagues that I have uh, have retired early, um, you know, their 60s, early 60s. And hey, I'm, I'm stepping away. So a whole pool of this baby boom generation has stepped out into semi or full retirement. So there's a big gap that is left by that. And then also the, the issue of, of um, childcare, quality of life and balance with, because obviously work isn't the only thing that, that we have in our lives. And so as businesses, we need to be responsive to that. And I just appreciate uh, what Ms. Barry and Neil were talking about today in terms of how there's been such a innovative kind of approach to acknowledging the human side of business and recognizing that there's more to business than the business itself. And we need to be aligned with those that we're serving, our clients, customers, our associates, partners, in a way that you know, can work for all. And so just being flexible and responsive to, to those changing needs and trends, I think is going to continue to, to be a good thing that uh, the pandemic has kind of put on us. Thanks for bringing up the childcare issue. And actually, uh, uh, Macy, before I, uh, I turn it over to you, that kind of just to kind of tee up something I was interested in asking about. Um, <clears throat> we know just from looking at the data and, uh, and as well as from a lot of the stories that we're hearing that the pandemic has had uh, an outsized impact on uh, particularly young women uh, workers in the labor force. And they've been more likely to 
uh, uh, pull out of the labor force or to stay out of the labor force if they lose their jobs. And that's largely um, a lot that has a lot to do with the, the need to provide child care uh, during this time. And I'm wondering, um, as somebody who uh, represents a lot of women business owners, um, uh, whether you're seeing a similar trend like that with, uh, with, with women business owners as well. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm the best person to ask that question. Okay. It's certainly happening. Um, you know, I, I th the the population I tend to work with um, have the child care. Um, and then that's not always the case, but, you know, they either have the ability to bring their kids with them to work um, because they own their businesses or they have other family members who can lend a hand in terms of child care. Um, and I, I realize that that's not always the case, but that's been the case, at least with the business owners that uh, women business owners that we tend to work with. Um, but I can tell you that it, in generally speaking, um, you know, many of them have had to, they, they've been busy, these business owners, because they haven't been able to find the help um, that they typically have been able to have. And so one, either the revenue is not coming in, or they just simply aren't able to find the people to help. So they have, they have to go on the floor, um, they have to do the work themselves in order to keep their businesses um, open. Yeah, I, I actually, um, you know, one of the interesting things that, that Ron uh, shared in this presentation was what we've been seeing in the surveys is that our, our minority and women owned businesses in the surveys were actually less likely than other businesses to report that labor availability is a challenge for them. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, um, if, if you feel that that's the, the case among folks that you talk to, or um, and if, if, if not, why, you know, why not? Um, you know, Ron qualified that a little bit in terms of the composition of folks that were responding. And I'm wondering, um, you know, uh, what you think might be might be going on there. And again, uh, I, Emmanuel, I haven't actually uh, ha uh, turned to you yet uh, in this part of the discussion. So if you want to if you want to chime in. It looks like you're on mute. Which part of it, though? Oh, uh, just what, just uh, just about the, um, the the impact of uh, labor availability, and uh, you know, we kind of saw this 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 uh, this result in some of the surveys that it was actually less likely to impact uh, uh, women or minority-owned businesses than 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 other businesses. Um, I don't think, from what you've told me, that that's been your experience, but I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about the the worker shortage and how that's affected you. Yeah, it's a, it's a unique position we have. Um... The labor shortage is, is affecting a lot of business owners in our neck of the woods, um, just from discussion between um, business owners, especially because of just different economic changes that are going on. Um, there's a huge disparity of wealth. Um, there is some transfer of wealth between the baby boomers, but I mean, it's very minimal because a lot of people are not engaging into actually facilitating that, that transfer properly. Um, but when it comes to big business, they will take as much um, of a leg up as possible. I know that in our specific community situation, we have uh, Amazon coming in and that is affecting um, pay. Um, it's affecting pay with, with, with businesses. So businesses are trying to attract talent and retain talent. Um, well, when you have um, pay disparity to the point where it's almost educational level pay um, for um, starting off employees uh, with Amazon at $25 to $28 an hour. Um, it, it, becomes, it becomes lopsided because now we're talking about a lot of options that employees are having over employers. And so it becomes a different type of power, um, a pendulum swing. I guess, um, into, into the hand of the employees because there's so many people that are looking for employees versus, um, you know, looking for employment. And so, uh, because there's, so, there's just, there's, there's a bunch of opportunities available. I know I have lost personally, um, I have lost uh, workers because of just the exploration mindset of people to now just try whatever and to and and people feel like there's more of a safety net in this pandemic um, um era i guess um so i don't know how to couch it but we are seeing a lot of, of um we're seeing a labor shortage 
Um, but it's just because now people are realizing that they have more power than the employers. Another thing that, uh, that, that came up a lot in our earlier discussion uh, and then also Ron hit on in his presentation was uh, what we're seeing in terms of the supply chain issues and, uh, and the availability of inputs and cost of inputs. Uh, again, just kind of wondering sort of broadly if you can talk about uh, your experience there, whether you've seen any change. And early on in the, the earliest part of the pandemic, we saw the most uh, 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 severe uh, uh, supply chain uh, contractions in kind of more the sort of uh, the non-durable goods space. Uh, you know, obviously we're all familiar with the toilet paper shortage and the, the paper towel shortages that were happening early on in the pandemic. Um, but then of course that's sort of spread more broadly um, uh, within the manufacturing sector. And just kind of wondering, uh, again, where you've, where you've seen the biggest bottlenecks and how that's, uh, how that's, affecting, how that's affecting you. And I don't know, again, uh, uh, Macy, since, uh, since you represent a lot of different firms, um, whether you have any kind of more sort of general insights you, you might be able to offer on that. You're on mute. I'm gonna, I apologize. I was trying to answer a question that was on, on uh, <laughs> the Q&A. Um, that one more time, Joe, I apologize. It's no problem, actually. I was going to turn to the Q and A next. In fact, if you were um, if you were offering an answer to the question in the Q and A, why don't we um, why don't you just share that with everyone? In fact, I think the question you were answering was someone submitted a question. I'd love to hear what panelists think about what the recovery looks like and what will take what it will take for BIPOC businesses to thrive in the future. Right. I, I was going to say uh, technology is huge. I think support mm -hmm. in technology providing that's uh, it, that is just huge. Um, you know, uh, many of them need support in, in understanding how to put financial projection. I mean, sorry, their financial statements together. Um, a lot uh, in order to receive funds. Um, these last two years, many of our small businesses, our BIPOC uh, businesses, is, there are micro businesses um, that we work with, and they struggled with having official financial statements that they could submit in order to receive these funds. And they, I think they quickly realized, wow, this is an issue. If I don't have this together. Um, I can't get these funds that are supposedly pretty easy to receive. Um, and we helped many of them through that. Uh, getting the support to understand how to put um, data into QuickBooks, for example, right? Um, just having access to that, uh, how to move online, um, how to move their businesses online. Uh, all of that, um, again, goes back to the use of technology. And yeah, I would like to, uh, we, did, we did get a question in the Q&A about inflation, which was, uh, which was part of why I, I wanted to, to ask about that as well. But um, I don't know if uh, if Mike or Emmanuel, you have anything else to to offer on that question about kind of what it's gonna what it's gonna take for uh, for BIPOC businesses to thrive in the future and how how you think this recovery is taking shape. I'd say that um, you know everything in life and business it tends to go in cycles, and you know there's there's the peaks and valleys, and and then kind of the plateaus in between. And I think right now, from a pandemic standpoint, you know, we've gone through a lot of changes in, in order to adapt and and survive and and hopefully continue to thrive. I think right now that um, there's there's a lot of uh, funds in the in the system, and I think that this is a a, a great opportunity for small business, uh, minority women-owned businesses in particular to, to step in and, and find a source of, of um, kind of viability during this time. And then I think there needs to be thought in terms of how this peak you know, is going to play itself out um, such that you don't wanna overplay it either. And so in, in our particular case, we've, for the first time been turning away more business than we've been taking on simply because we don't have the capacity to take it on, but also because we know that these funds are going to ultimately deplete it and it's going to come back to another, uh, another state. And so we need to position for the long term, not for the, not for the short term. And we need to do it in a way that we can remain strong without, you know, getting ahead uh, of the headlights here. So I think the, the next phase in the pandemic, at least from the perspective of the clients that we serve, is um, how do you invest these dollars that have been infused into the economy in a way that can be sustainable and can grow and, and um, can continue to 
contribute rather than just kind of a one time, one and done, and then um, things start to retract. I want to thank you for uh, addressing kind of another question that was there in the Q and A, which is what uh, what given that we know what we know about the challenges of accessing some of these funds that have been available, what can government agencies and others do to better uh, to better communicate with um, with business owners of color and women-owned businesses uh, about their availability and how to access them. Um, but I want to actually uh, give Manuel uh, an opportunity to chime in on that last question uh, about kind of how the recovery is taking shape. Um, uh, what do you think it's going to take to thrive in the future? And uh, and I think that uh, we'll probably uh, we'll probably make that our last uh, our last uh, question of this panel. And I just want uh, to uh, uh, want to hear from you on that as well, Emmanuel. Oh, um, thank you very much. Um, I think Mike put it put it very nicely um, in terms of um, as a BIPOC business um, being intentional with your uh, resources, being very intentional. In fact, this pandemic has made people think that way because now it's not necessarily about how many people you reach. It's strategically who are you reaching that will have more of a long lasting impact. Um, my field is managing risk. And so I'm hopefully risk averse enough. <laughs> um, I know that um, I've changed, obviously I've, 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 I've adapted through life, but um, we have to be thinking intentionally for the future. And so my thing was with the change in the, the COVID situation, and having my, my workers going remote, um, I was looking at, well, what part of that is positive and what part of that is negative. And so I took some of those factors and I hybridized that into our agency. So our, our agency, um, I let our workers come in and they, they have to be in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. But other than that, they're working from home and it gives them flexibility to attend to things like childcare or other things while they're working um, without, it's, it's, it's like it answers non-tangibles um, because it helps people have the freedom to feel like they're a little bit more in control and then they can actually dictate things better. They, the, the, the work ethic ends up coming out um, as a win-win. Um, every business owner is very skeptical of giving the reins entirely to an employee and then just them going off. And then you're like, well, what are they doing? <laughs> you know, so that's, that's, that's always been, that was the hardest part of, of seeding control when I started the whole remote work thing, when we were fully hundred percent remote, I realized there were, there were caveats to it on both sides. Um, in terms of technology and broadband challenges, I know that, it was hard to start off, um, and I'm a techie. I love tech, technology, and and but I mean we had issues with people's routers at home because I had to figure out well why were the calls not coming to uh, someone's cell phone, and it was because some providers have specific block offs that will like even like um, people who have um, iPhones they have specific issues with connecting with other services. Um, and so there were just a lot of nuances that I had to kind of uh, suffer through as a business owner. But I mean, it, it, I mean the technology, and, you know, it's, there's a lot of how-tos. So at the end of the day, we were able to go through that and we came out unscathed. We didn't lose a lot of customers because of it. Um, and, but my biggest thing is as a person of color, um, as a minority business owner, um, I look at things on a macro scale because of my upbringing and because the, of the fact that I was not born in the United States. So I was born in Nigeria um, and I lived in England for six and a half years. So I look at how we're relatable to people. And I think that context is everything when we're talking about situational awareness. So we have to um, give perspective where perspective is due. Because for us to understand where someone's coming from, we have to try to put ourselves in the shoe. And that might mean giving pause before even giving a statement. So that's why I just feel that this whole time period has given me a lot more um, gumption 
to step up and collaborate with the community. Um, I do a lot of community work, um, volunteer opportunities. I try not to overexert myself too much because I, you know, you can that can get the worst of you. But community co collaboration helps with educating even um, um, BIPOCs or um, you know um, of of opportunities for funding and for things like that. So there's just many avenues we have to be willing to, um, um, a lot of things can be said, but mm -hmm. things are better done than said. Um, I, and there's this, a quote I was gonna go, and this is my last statement here too, a quote I was gonna go, go by, or I, I've been going by for quite a long time. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's uh, one of my friends, he said that wants show up in conversation, um, but expectations show up in behavior. And that to me talks about intentionality because you might think that you might, you want something, but your, your, your actions speak much louder than just those words. So. That's a great way to conclude this conversation. Thank you all for, 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 for sharing with us and for kind of helping us highlight some of the work that we've uh, that 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 we've been engaged in continue to get to expand, um, and more importantly, why uh, over over the last year, uh, and I hope that you can uh, continue that you can join us for the the rest of uh, our event this morning. Um, there are some questions that we didn't uh, that we weren't able to get to from the audience, but I would encourage you to uh, to to uh, to please continue submitting questions out there in the audience, and maybe our panelists can interact with you uh, uh, by by typing some answers out for you if they're willing to do so. I don't want to volunteer their time, and thank you so much for sharing your time uh, with us today. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, thank you. Matt. Thank you. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague uh, Eric Garcia Luna, who is going to tee up our second panel on the worker experience by uh, talking a little bit about, uh, about our, our, our ongoing work in that area. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Eric. Thank you, Joe. And welcome everyone to the final part of our Regional Economic Conditions Conference. Uh, my name is Eric Garcia Luna. As uh, Joe and uh, Ron mentioned, I'm uh, one of the directors uh, here in the regional outreach team. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen uh, so that I can get started with that presentation real quick. Okay. All right. So uh, before we move into the panel, as, um, as Joe mentioned, um, you know, I'm going to go briefly over some of the work that we have been doing to learn more about labor dynamics from the labor supply side. A quick reminder that the views I will be expressing here today are mine and not those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis or the Federal Reserve System. And um, as you heard today, earlier today, we um, heard Ron talk about uh, one of uh, the two new directions we have taken at the Minneapolis Fed to track the economy of the ninth district. Uh, he focused on our efforts to diversify the input we receive uh, from businesses to bring the perspective of minority and women entrepreneurs to the table. The second part of that diversification effort, the one I will cover here is uh, our focus on workers. Uh, but why is it important for us to know more from workers? As you know, the Federal Reserve operates under a congressional mandate to achieve two goals, uh, stable prices and maximum employment. The pursuit of these two goals affect the economy by promoting a stable monetary environment. To help inform our monetary policy work, we rely on partners that help us understand the economic realities of the district in as close to real time as possible. Traditionally, that information on labor dynamics has come from industry partners, tremendously useful information, but it unfortunately only gives us a partial view into what's happening in the labor market. So to paint a more holistic picture and to do so in as close to real time as possible, we have been uh, working with labor organizations, workforce development professionals, community organizations, and even workers to help us shape up this work through ongoing dialogues and surveys. Uh, you're going to hear from some of them uh, in just a few minutes here. In more applicable terms, hearing from workers may offer insights on some aspects of today's labor market. As we know, job openings are well above pre-pandemic times. There are a lot of jobs out there. Yet 
after significant recovery after a significant recovery in May of 2020, hiring has remained relatively flat. Meanwhile, data on those who are leaving their jobs has been on an upward trajectory for more than a year. Where are those workers going and why? There is really no straightforward answer. The variables influencing those decisions are many. And looking at available data and developing our own tools, we have learned you know, just a few things. So as we did our work last summer, for example, we heard of the hiring struggles that, that uh, businesses were having. Uh, many people assumed that, that, you know, that people were holding back from joining the workforce because they were perhaps receiving generous unemployment benefits and stimulus payments. Nine district data from the census poll survey, though, shows that while there, has in, there was indeed a considerable use of those benefits, particularly in the first half of 2020, it has generally trended downward, and many households relied on a mix of other sources of income. Most respondents said, for example, that they continue to rely on regular income sources, the income of a domestic partner, for example. Uh, but the data also suge suggests that more individuals have been using credit, reaching into their savings or selling, uh, selling uh, their belongings, and even borrowing from their friends and family as the pandemic unfolded. As you can see, it is a very complex portrait of the financial reality for many families. In a survey we did with, uh, in partnership with labor organizations, uh, service and hospitality low wage workers in the Twin Cities also shared with us what sources of income their families used to meet their needs before and during the pandemic. Most of them said they continue to rely on regular income. Employment insurance was used roughly five times more during the pandemic, but here too, it was far from being the only source of income respondents used. 50% of respondents said they used credit and loans, an increase of approximately 25% above pre-pandemic times. Borrowing from family and friends and the use of savings or having to sell their belongings to meet their needs almost double. While these results are not statistically significant, uh, they showcase the complexity of workers' finances and provide some insight into why the termination of pandemic benefits may not have had the effect many were hoping for. Back in the summer, many of these workers were trying to make some occupational changes. 58% um, said they were uh, looking for better pay. 47% said they wanted better benefits. Others were looking for changes that ranged from finding permanent employment to being able to get more hours in their current jobs. 40% said they wanted to work in a different field, while 43% wanted more flexibility in their jobs to balance their work and family responsibilities. As they moved or attempted to move uh, through the labor market, they faced a variety of challenges. Some of them specific to the jobs, uh, such as location, scheduling, benefits, or compensation. Other aspects are more complex and have to do with workers' ability to maintain a healthy work-life balance and self-investment challenges. As you can see on this graph, 51% said they need more, they needed more computer knowledge and 30% said they, need more, uh, they needed a computer and internet access. Respondents recognize their need, <clears throat> their need for other skills or their need for certifications. And yet, while many are willing to pursue those, 57% indicated they either do not have the time or know how to go about getting trained. 32% said to be constrained by family and caretaking responsibilities. That seems to be a, a common uh, theme across uh, what you've heard this morning. Um, surveyed workers express concerns over a range of issues as well. COVID exposure concerns have been you know, constantly present, particularly as many of the workers we surveyed uh, had no choice but to go to work during the pandemic. 37% said transportation to get to and from work was a concern. But possibly more worrisome is the fact that more than half of the survey workers are concerned about paying for the basics, such as food, housing, healthcare, and utilities. As part of this effort, we also surveyed workforce professionals. They also told us that in their opinion and based on their experiences, what, the, what they thought the biggest obstacles were among those uh, people looking for a job. This chart shows an overwhelming range of possible barriers to labor participation. Some perceived to be more extreme than others. Daycare affordability tops the list, followed by housing, transportation, 
and low pay at available jobs. Here too, some of these obstacles are employer-based while others are more complex and relate to workers' ability to self-invest. Lastly, from that same survey, we learned that during the course of the pandemic, uh, workers may have turned down jobs because of family responsibilities again, or because the job did not meet their needs or expectations, um, and they were more, conf and they were more confident uh, that they could find a better option out there. Uh, motivation reasons is also listed here, but that's a very broad category, uh, a little bit difficult to interpret. Motivation in some cases could be related to one or more of the uh, many obstacles you saw earlier in the presentation. Um, I'm gonna end by saying that as we've carried out our work in this sphere, uh, we've constantly heard that people want to work. We also heard of the many challenges families have faced and that may be affecting workers' definitions of a good job, influencing what they are willing to take for their time. As one of our partners put it, and I quote, the pandemic has made people more comfortable with failure Workers want to feel productive and they are taking risks. And with that, I thank you for being here and off to you, Joe. All right. Thank you, Eric, for, for teeing up our discussion. We have uh, some, some great uh, panelists with us this morning. Uh, and as with our first panel, I'm just going to uh, go around and have, have folks introduce themselves. Um, and I think, uh, I'm going to start with uh, uh, with Joe. Uh, uh, if you could introduce yourself, and then uh, I'll turn it over to our other panelists. Ao mataki wape hane la shinwaste, Dr. Joe Hobat Unpapa Lakota, and I serve as the president and CEO of the American Indian OIC, a workforce development and education nonprofit working with the urban indigenous population of the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and Saint Paul. Thank you very much for being here with us this morning. Uh, <clears throat> Brianne, would you introduce yourself to our audience? Uh, it looks like your audio is maybe not working. Yeah, we're not getting uh, we're not getting uh, audio feed from you. Uh, it might be uh, might be that your your headset is muted uh, off board or something like that. Um, well, while we try and get that figured out, Wade, uh, maybe uh, maybe you could introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Wade Lunenberg. Uh, I'm with Unite here, Local 17. It's Minnesota's hospitality union. Uh, we have uh, 8,000 workers across Minnesota and the Twin Cities, Bloomington and Rochester. And uh, our membership is basically um, uh, working in hotels, our convention centers, our sports facilities, uh, and also in our airport. All righty. And uh, Brianne, have you been able to? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. Um, so good afternoon from Northern Michigan, where it is now just afternoon. Um, I am in Marquette, Michigan. Um, I work for Manpower Group. We are a global staffing and recruiting company based out of Milwaukee. Um, and I am the market manager for the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and very happy to be here today. All right, well, thank the three of you. Uh, thanks to the three of you for joining us. Uh, we do have a uh, fourth panelist who might be might be joining us uh, a little bit late, and um, we'll just we'll just uh, uh, see if he can he can get on. I think he's having some tech technical difficulties, but we will uh, we'll just start uh, we'll, we'll just start uh, the conversation with the three of us right now, and and uh, or the, the four of us rather. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so you saw a lot in Eric's in Eric's presentation about uh, some of the outreach that we're doing, uh, trying to work. Uh, Reach, reach workers directly, but also through through uh, labor unions, intermediary type of organizations, uh, some of those that you represent here uh, as well. And um, and we heard a lot in our first discussion uh, with Neil and Corey about the, the labor shortage. So I'm just going to start it there. Um, really, the, the big question is, uh, do you see the, the labor market tightness that we're hearing about from businesses as being uh, a worker shortage, and what do you think are the biggest uh, the biggest drivers of that, and the biggest obstacles uh, to to uh, participating in the labor force among the folks that you work with? And I'll just um, I'll just maybe uh, start with uh, with Brianne. All right. Um, 
I think this is a, a million dollar question on on when we think that this may be ending here. And I think Corey hit on it this morning um, that she expects really this labor shortage to be with us for another, I think she said 12 to 24 months. And I really do agree with that. I think one thing that's important for us to remember is we had a talent shortage before the pandemic hit. Um, so it's it, it was already there before it hit and then it just got worse when the pandemic hit in 2020. Um, and we are seeing some improvements, but um, there are obstacles out there that we are still dealing with and I think we will be for some time. Um, one of the obstacles that I see from where I sit as a staffing, um, working at, for a staffing company would be um, people are still afraid to go to work. Um, again, that's something that everybody already knows out there. Um, but even if you're vaccinated, people are still afraid to go to work for whatever reason that is. Maybe they have an unvaccinated child at home. Maybe they're immunocompromised themselves. Um, so that is definitely a portion that we are dealing with as an obstacle of trying to get people to work. Um, another obstacle we're dealing with is something we've talked about earlier on this morning was inflation and pay rates. So the few individuals that are looking for work, um, the few and the few quality ones, you know, they want the highest pay rate that they can get. Um, and I don't blame them because that's something that we all need to pay our bills, which we saw in Eric's presentation is one of the biggest reasons why is people are having a hard time paying their bills right now. So an obstacle for the job seekers, but also for the employers is that pay rate. And we'll talk about it here probably in some further questions on this panel, but um, obstacle on both sides is that pay rate and the employees that are looking are just trying to find the highest one they can, leaving those lower level jobs, maybe a company that has not increased their pay rate during the pandemic with their jobs unfilled. Um, so I think it's pay rate. I think it's fear of going to work because of COVID. And then I also think that it is childcare. I'm a working mom. I have two little kids, three-year-old and a six-year-old. Um, and I can tell you working from home with kids is not glamorous. Um, so some people think like I want a remote job and I'll take care of my kids, but it's, it's, not, it's not easy. So I think that the obstacles that we're seeing of the individuals that maybe think they're going to look for work is all of a sudden schools are, you know, on lockdown and kids are back at home and they're on quarantine. It's the unexpected um, in the childcare situation. So pay, afraid of COVID, and then if you have kids, um, childcare, or maybe you're an employer that employs people with children, childcare is definitely um, has its ups and downs right now. All right, thanks, Brian. Before I turn it over to uh, our other panelists, I see that our fourth panelist, uh, uh, Scott Eichner, has been able to to join us. So, Scott, uh, we just got, we just kicked things off here. Uh, we saw Eric's presentation, uh, and we're starting to talk about the labor shortage. But I, but before we continue that conversation, could you introduce yourself to the audience, please? Absolutely. You would think two years into this, I would know how to work my computer. I apologize for my time. It happens to all of us. I'm, anyway, uh, yeah, uh, good morning. My name is Scott Eichner. I'm with the Montana Department of Labor and Industry uh, Workforce Services. Happy to be here. All right, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, so we were just, uh, Brianne brought up a lot of the, uh, the obstacles that we're hearing about uh, that are kind of behind the sort of extra tight labor market conditions. Um, you know, Neil and uh, as Neil mentioned in our first panel, we're still Total employment nationwide is still a few million below uh, where, where, where it, it would be uh, had the pandemic not happened or uh, where we think it would be. Um, so we're kind of wondering uh, about that, that, that labor supply and why, uh, so, so for workers who are sitting on the sidelines, what's keeping them out of the labor market. And Wade, uh, you represent a lot of frontline workers um, who, uh, you know, Brianne had mentioned the, uh, the risks that, uh, that folks are are exposed to with the pandemic and particularly with this current wave that we're seeing right now. And I wonder uh, if you have any, any thoughts uh, that you could share with us about what's going on uh, with the labor market. Yeah, um, I think that, it, you know, I'll just kind of level set just a little bit um, in hospitality. It, it's a vast industry and, and, and it's, it's, it's so recognizable to the consumer and uh, to the public uh, when you see restaurants and bars and uh, your coffee place down on the corner. But you know, one in ten one in ten Americans work in the industry in hotels and conferencing and airports as well, and so um, uh, what we're seeing moving forward is real uncertainty. You know, to to the point of obstacles. Uh, and Brian really hit the high points uh, that that I could I could confirm that uh, uh, COVID in a customer facing industry is really tough. Um, uh, it's hard for workers to go to work. Uh, not knowing what the what the um, status of that customer might be, or uh, the person working next to them, 
um, also reliable work um, with uh, uh, the shutdowns and um, uh, you know perhaps more occasionally now, but uh, those kinds of barriers um, uh, at work are really a problem in, in hospitality, in retail, uh, in, um, in building services. Um, uh, and, and the other extreme is scheduling too much work because of the shortages. Uh, and so folks are, are, are going from perhaps a job that was 30 hours a week, and then they were able to go home and, and uh, do latchkey in their own family with kids uh, to now working 45 hours a week. Um, and I think that um, Brianne really hit it with um, reliable, um, a reliable turn to help, uh, return to help child care is going to be really, really key to, um, uh, to really get folks back into, the, into these various industries. And of course, that's um, that only happens if um, our schools are are open and uh, reliable as well. So I think it's about um, uh, uncertainty and finding that right balance that hopefully comes this spring. Yeah, I, I hope we have time to talk a little bit more specifically, maybe about childcare challenges later. But Joe, uh, what do you think? Uh, in a, you know, in addition to, or if you want to echo what other panelists have said, uh, what is going on with the uh, with the workers? Yeah, I, I think that Eric's uh, presentation to, to open up this, this section uh, of the discussion was on point. It's the same kind of anecdotal evidence that we're seeing within our organization. Unfortunately, I think I'm a little bit more pessimistic than folks. I, I believe that this is going to be, at least speaking from the perspective of Minnesota and the local region in which we operate, uh, we believe this is going to be the new normal, uh, probably extending five years or longer. Uh, we don't really believe this to be an anomaly brought on by the pandemic, but really an acceleration of trends that we saw coming for a while. And I think specifically in Minnesota, with the increasing uh, retirements uh, and the changing demographics of the labor force here within the state, we see that the, the Caucasian portion uh, really being coming the, the majority minority as communities of color become the majority population within the state. And it's become uh, increasingly evident that this is an untapped reservoir of, of labor talent for a variety of reasons, that there is an enormous skills gap that needs to be addressed within the communities of color, particularly the indigenous community. Uh, and we also see uh, some uh, misnomers about the economic data that led up to the pandemic. We saw a really high participation rate within the economies, but what we know to be true is our clients, our community members, were oftentimes working two or three jobs at, at really suppressed wages just to make ends meet. And so when we talk about those data points about greater flexibility, uh, greater income, this really, I think, speaks to that phenomena where we see in our community, folks wanna make a living wage with one singular job uh, to be able to have a 40 hour work week. Uh, that's just not happening. And so we see so a combination of suppressed wages, uh, a skills gap that's uh, inhibiting people from onboarding into the economy uh, that needs to be addressed. And, and I think the antecedents that lead to this problem, uh, where we really see the chickens coming home to roost, is, is a breakdown in K-12 uh, in terms of training and, and preparing our workforce coming out of public education. We also see not only the suppressed wages being offered uh, within uh, within the, the economy that we need to see those wages start to, we are starting to see those wages come up as the market forces are, are, are starting to adjust, but it's got a long ways to go. And then those in the professional sector that, that provide these services, we see a debt burden that is unprecedented, particularly and specifically around student loans. And so we see a whole confluence of events that are coming in, the changing demographics of the labor pool here within the state of Minnesota, suppressed wages, an unprecedented debt burden, uh, and, and really a need for meaningful career placements or meaningful career wages uh, to start being effectuated within the economy. And until we start addressing those issues, we're, we're going to see not only a labor shortage, uh, because we aren't tapping into that labor pool, but what I refer to as a labor hesitancy. Folks aren't really going to get into the game and take two or three jobs and, and really kind of push up that labor participation rate that we'd seen in years past uh, because these wages are just not sufficient. So that's kind of our experience. And I, I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer. I think the silver lining is that we can at least identify these areas and get to work at addressing them. No, we, we want everyone here to be uh, to be honest, whether they're whether they're Debbie Downers or or, or, or not. So thanks for contributing. We're again we'll talk more about wages uh, in a moment. But Scott, um, just to kind of round out this first uh, this first question, what's the picture looking like in Montana? Very similar to what everybody else has described, um, and and I'm, I I would agree with everything that everybody has said. 
one of the things that we have found interesting is, you know, two, three years ago, we were talking about the future work and looking at 2030 as kind of this, this time when a whole bunch of things would change and a lot of things would um, that had slowly matriculated up would, would kind of come to a head. You talk about flexibility in the work and the change in the dynamic of the, of the demographics of the workforce and the automation revolution and all these things. And so much of that, what happened was it happened overnight, right? So rather than having 10 or 12 years for us to slowly figure out our ways and get into that and be comfortable with it, it showed up on our doorstep in about a year and we're, we're reeling trying to figure out how that works. And so that I, I agree with Joe and, and Wade, everybody that the way that that has trickled, that that trickles into all the aspects of this and everybody's trying to play catch up and understand what that means and, and you know, make up 10 years in the span of two is just, um, it's uh, makes for an interesting day. It makes for an interesting day. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, you all kind of hinted at, you know, you all talked about the wage picture a little bit. Um, and I want to kind of expand on that and ask, um, what do you think employers can do to attract workers? These folks that we're hearing from uh, all over our region who are saying they can't, they can't fill open positions. Uh, uh, what, what, do you, what do you think are the, the biggest levers that they might have uh, at, their, at, 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 at their disposal to, to attract more workers to open positions? Well, I'll, I'll dive in. I mean, we have ongoing discussions with, we have a, a whole cadre of employer partners that we work with that helps facilitate our placements for our graduates from our training programs or through our employment services. And we have ongoing discussions and trying to help coordinate with employers within the Twin Cities and Minnesota area. And I think some of the key factors that they could do to elicit this change and accelerate it, number one, in, increase wages. Uh, this, the, the debate over $15 an hour minimum wage, I think is, is quaint. And I think we need to see a, a dramatic increase in, in these wages, particularly at, at entry level and, and preliminary level places of employment. The other aspects that we could uh, challenge employers to think about is revisiting through their HR, uh, the qualifications needed for certain positions. Uh, it seemed to be kind of just this cookie cutter approach of four year bachelor's degree, four years minimum experience, which really wasn't necessary for the, the ability to do the job. And so I think a top to tails reassessment of the qualifications that are needed for a lot of these uh, these positions that are needed within our economy should be reevaluated and, and, and approximated to what is actually needed to do the job. Uh, there are plenty of certificate training programs that like our organization provides that can provide workforce needs for these employers that can do the job effectively that don't require a four-year degree. And that goes to the heart of some of those data points that I think Eric was bringing up was the luxury of time and resources to secure uh, the training required to meet these bare minimum um, credentialing requirements to, to seek these employment uh, opportunities. Uh, folks just don't have the time to go secure a, a bachelor's degree or, or to take a two to three year period of, of training in order to, to do this work when it can be effectuated much sooner in much more expedited fashion let alone the resources to do it. And I think there's a huge hesitancy to incur debt through student loans to, to pay for such education. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're in a dynamic where we're competing with, with the post-secondary institution in this in this state uh, that say otherwise that say that really if you're going to have a, a workforce that's going to be meaningful and, and able to do the work they really ought to have a bachelor's degree well that isn't true and so until we start clearing through the clutter of these voices uh, I, I, I think those are things that employers are going to have to take a hard look at Brianne, I want to ask you actually to maybe maybe respond to something Joe just said, um, and I want to hear I, I want to hear from folks more generally about you know the answer to this question about what what more employers can do. Um, but Joe was talking about uh, educational requirements, and I wonder um, uh, more broadly uh, what 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 sort of successful strategies you're seeing from uh, employers in your region and attracting workers in the UP, um, and more specifically whether whether or not you're seeing more employers willing to maybe uh, drop some of the educational requirements for open positions? Are they saying, is this a position that really requires a four-year degree uh, or does it just require someone who's competent and experienced? I wonder if you're seeing that going on. Um, I would say that, you know, a lot of the employers that we work with really just care about the high school diploma. And I, I know that sounds like absolutely crazy to think about, but um, a lot of the employers that we work with say they need to have a GED or a high school diploma, that's what they need. And then we'll have specific positions where they may need a little bit more than that. Um, but it is really nice to see the employers just look at the ex actual experience and work-related experience instead of a four-year degree. Um, so we really 
not very often do we see employers come to us and say they have to have a bachelor's degree. Usually it's looking at the experience, um, looking for long um, job longevity, and not necessarily looking at the actual degree, which I love that Joe brought that up. That was something that was not, I did not have um, when I was thinking about what employers can do to attract talent. I didn't think about that, but that is a great example of, um, you know, one of my recruiters that I have here, she's been here for nine years. She doesn't have a college degree. She is I just did my review um, yesterday for myself and I just talked about how great my team is and how she is a rock star of an employee. It doesn't matter that she doesn't have a degree to me. She is one of the most valuable people that I have on my team. Um, so I think where I sit, when I talk to new employers, where they're coming to me and they tell me what they want in a person, it's usually, all right, let's look at the experience that you're looking for, who's worked in the past, not necessarily what can they put on paper and where did they go to school? Um, so that's really what I'm trying to do to encourage um, employers to get more people to fill their jobs is adjust some of those requirements that maybe you had five to six years ago. Um, so that's answering that question. Can I add some other things that I think that Please, yeah. could do? Okay. Um, so not only pay, we've all talked about that. I mean, if you don't know that pay is something you should be increasing right now. I mean, I think most people do know that. Um, we have seen our clients that we work with, which we have 23 active um, clients, which are companies that we hire for in the Upper Peninsula right now. I would say almost all of them have increased their pay rate during the pandemic. And that's really us working with them. If they're not doing it on their own, providing them with wage data analysis is, um, manpower does a manpower employment outlook survey. Um, this is our 60th year of doing it. And we reach out to 39,000 employers and kind of ask them what they're seeing and what they're anticipating happening in the next quarter. And um, in that survey, we talk a lot about how important it is to increase the pay rates, but also um, this last one that just came out was actually very interesting. Um, it's showing that 51% of employers are that are clerical in nature are switching to a hybrid work schedule. So I think not only increasing those pay rates, but it's the benefits. So, you know, job seekers are going to see, you know, hundred openings and yes, they're going to go towards the highest pay rate, but some of them are looking at the actual beyond that pay rate. What are the benefits? What does your PTO look like? What is your health insurance? A lot of companies are not offering animal pet, pet insurance, um, you know, uh, parental leaves. Um, it's the flexible work schedule. So it's, it's not only the pay rate, but it's what are you going to do to try to attract, but actually retain those people. And it's keeping them happy. Um, manpower is going to have a hybrid work schedule past the pandemic. We realize that people like the flexibility, especially as a working mom. You know, I like that I can get my kids to school and not necessarily look worry about what I look like from the waist down. Um, and I can work from home that day. Um, so it's that flexibility that is keeping me happy in my job. So we're seeing a lot of employers adapt um, benefits and flexibility in the workplace that's helping them attract talent. I will say that pet insurance is not something that I would have considered, but it sounds yeah. like, uh, it sounds like <laughs> it'd be pretty nice to have. Um, yeah. uh, uh, Wade, what about, what, what about you? What are, uh, I mean, I maybe you want to speak specifically to the kind of hospitality sector or some of the other uh, workers that Unite here represents. Um, yeah. Um, well, in, you know, I, I think that um, in hospitality and again in retail, uh, so you know groceries uh, or 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 uh, just more traditional retail stores, uh, you know those are industries that historically uh, have gotten a pass on um, uh, paying lower wages uh, um, and oftentimes uh, no health care, uh, no pension benefits, no retirement benefits, uh, and, um, and 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 they've really gotten a pass for a long time. Um, I happen to be signatory to um, 40 high road employers that, you know, provide health care benefits that are uh, cost free to the employee. Uh, they have a they have a Taft Hartley pension benefit. Um, if they choose to stay that stay with the employer for a period of time uh, and they pay higher wages. Um, and uh, so there is a there is a way to get it done. Uh, but one of the other challenges with with um, uh, hospitality and retail. And, and in building services is, is really that um, there has been a lack of that kind of enthusiasm from, from employers um, historically. And so um, certainly to Joe and Brianne's point, uh, wages, maybe that's being, maybe that's being addressed in, a, in, in, in the short term, but long term, it's, it, it is uh, going to be, uh, remain key to attracting people. Healthcare has never been more important. We've, we've learned that in COVID. 
um, and workers in, in these, in these uh, service sector industries uh, every day in COVID still had to go to work. And again, work in those, in, work in those environments uh, with workers who may not have been vaccinated, customers who may not have been vaccinated, and overnight became a frontline employee. Um, and so there just needs to be a recognition uh, of, of, of the work that the work that the workers do every day, and really a better visioning on the part of the employers to make those jobs matter. So not just not just hiring them, but how are we going to retain them around wages and health care and laddering up in an operation and retraining for another position in an operation. And I think, and I do think that flexibility, at least in the short term, is going to be really, really important um, here in the next eighteen months to uh, two years. Great. Maybe we can uh, we can talk a little bit more about retention uh, later in the conversation if we if we've got time. But uh, but Scott, I just I, w- I want to turn it over to you as well and see um, kind of with you have any additional thoughts on what. Um, on what strategies are successful for employers who are navigating this labor market right now, um, what they can do to attract uh, new workers. Sure, I, I think it's everything everybody else said um, to Joe's point, rethinking what you're asking for and making it, I mean, you need the lowest, the lowest bar that you can have in this economy to attract people. You need to think about where you're asking for it from, how you're doing it, how you're engaging your community. You can't just post a job or put it on a website or anything anymore. You need to be engaging with your schools. You need to be engaging with community centers, places where those people are. Um, to go out and make sure that there's an awareness of what you do and how it can help them. The flexibility piece, I think, is huge. Um, the other piece uh, that goes along with the, the job posting and the requirements is commu- being able to communicate it. We have an employer, we have a retail establishment here in town. She pays $10 an hour. She has no problem staffing because she's come up with a marketing pitch to people, 30-second elevator pitch about how it's not about the, the salary. It's about unlimited hours. It's about um, health benefits for part-time employment. It's She has a way to sell it that's not solely about that. So yes, wages need to come up, um, absolutely. But there's also a, an element of messaging that, that if you can't get to $20 an hour, you need to figure out a way to, to make, you need to pitch for that so that people can buy into it. It can't just be um, the generic way you've done it. And then the other thing I would mention is um, intentional career pathways, right? We talk a lot about career pathways and everybody wants to do that. We don't have those, there are a few places that those are actually built into occupational Um, tracks, like apprenticeship is a great model because it does that, right? How can you take that model um, and apply it to other things where when somebody comes in and engages with you, if it's particularly these lower level jobs, and we've seen this uh, very evidently right now in the the behavioral health, um, direct care of lower level healthcare uh, occupations, how do you make a commitment to that person at the point of application and the, uh, the hiring process that you will, you will commit to them that if they do this job for a year, a year from now, you're going to put them in another training that takes them on to the next step. That it's not about you, that individual having to come and ask. It's not about hoping that the time is right. It is about committing up front to a career pathway to that individual if they want it. And then building that into their employment track and living up to that expectation, right? That that's another way that you can get some of these folks in. The apprenticeship model is, I think, is great from that standpoint. And you don't have to apply it the same way, right? The apprenticeship is pretty rigid in terms of pay raises and the gates that you have to hit. A lot of them are time-based. Um, competency-based is better um, in this day and age, um, right? We're, we're much more um, in this moment society, but to take that type of model and install it like you do an apprentice, you, apprenticeship come in and you know that it's laid out for that individual, what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. You don't have to do that as so rigidly, but making the offer and making sure that people are aware of that up front, I think is going to be huge. Again, particularly for some of these low level things that do have career pathways but that aren't built into the hiring process and that ongoing um, uh, employee development process. Um, <clears throat> well, you've all mentioned something that I would just agree with in our own work uh, here at the Fed, which is that the labor supply issues we're talking about were you know, preceded the pandemic. And in fact, in a way, if I go back to what, uh, what I was speaking about to audiences uh, prior to the pandemic, this is a lot, what I spent a lot of my time talking about. So these are longer term issues, you know, and the pandemic was kind of a very quick shift in directions for us where we had to, now all of a sudden we're dealing with mass unemployment. Um, and, uh, and, and so we're seeing, these, we're seeing these things bubble back up again. Um, <clears throat> we're getting a lot of questions in the Q&A, so I want to thank our audience members for submitting those. And in fact, one, uh, one that was uh, in response to, to some things that, uh, uh, that Dr. Habat uh, mentioned um, uh, about um, vocational and technical uh, training. Uh, the question is, 
Uh, workforce, you said workforce shortages preceded the pandemic. What is the government and Votech higher ed sector already doing for long-term adjustment? You outlined the obstacles. What will the government and education do about it? And I'm going to direct that question to you, Joe, uh, since it was kind of directed to you, but others uh, feel free to chime in as well. I think it's a great question. And, and I think there are some things afoot right now. We see, in, at least locally in Minnesota, the Department of Employment and Economic Development, uh, you know, working with nonprofits, CBOs to provide short-term expedited training programs in order to onboard folks into the economy at a quicker clip. But everything that we've been talking about here in this discussion is palliative care. Uh, it is a vicious cycle of whack-a-mole. If we don't get down to the root cause that's really generating a lot of these labor issues, and in my opinion and my estimation from, from my work, uh, this is really the breakdown in public education and particularly public education's relationship to communities of color and the indigenous community. Uh, it's not really devised nor created to create workers in the 21st century. It is an outdated model that needs to be reformed for externally from without. And what we keep seeing is the, the K-12 system reasserting its primacy that they can reform themselves in order to generate the workers and the critical thinkers that we need to onboard into this modern economy. It's not happening. And so what we're seeing the more progressive areas, particularly in, in Minneapolis, is a, is a greater partnership between community-based organizations, VOTEC training, uh, opportunities within uh, one-year, two-year institutions, deepening their, their relationship into high schools to start working with youth at a, at a different level than we've seen in probably the past 30 years. Uh, and until we have more widespread incursions into K-12, external reforms being foisted upon it, we're not really going to get anywhere. We're going to continue to see an underdeveloped uh, pool of labor, particularly in the community of color and, and in the indigenous community, that are going to be contending with this skills gap. And as we see the rate of change in technology, the increase in automation, that, that skills gap is only going to be exacerbated until we start addressing this root cause of the problem. So while there are some things afoot that are definitely positive and I think replicable, um, we're still far afield from addressing the root cause of, of what's, what's you know, creating this labor shortage. Anyone else have any thoughts on that they want to add? Well, uh... To Joe's point, I think that COVID quickly revealed uh, what the inequities were in our economy and, 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 and uh, particularly around workforce. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, the majority of our members and, and it plays out throughout the industry are women and BIPOC people and uh, immigrants. And, uh, um, uh, and until we really do address some of, the, some of the points that Joe brought up, uh, uh, we'll just continue to churn. And, uh, uh, and so we, we do need real change. And I see nothing but opportunities going forward, but it's hard work. And, uh, and, and so you have to be willing to do that. Well, changing direction slightly. Um, we've talked a little bit about, uh, about wages and um, the, need, the need to pay higher wages and then we are already seeing the market respond. Um, this is a topic that's uh, a question that's come into the Q&A on a topic that's very near and dear to us at the Fed having to do with inflation. Uh, we've seen some. Uh, we've seen acceleration in in, in inflation uh, in the data, and the cost of living, and just kind of wondering uh, how do you think the growth that we're seeing in wages right now relates to uh, just the higher prices for goods that uh, that workers are having to pay? Um, do you think that's a response to that, or is it more of a kind of a response to just uh, underlying labor market conditions? What do you think is going on there, and and what do you how do you think it's how do you think it's going to drive things going forward? I think from our perspective, the suppressed wages in some of these critical fields, particularly when we see in the supply chain is, is really driving some of the more, in my estimation, more of the immediate inflationary uh, causes. We saw a 7% increase just uh, reported this week. A lot of that is that we don't have the workers for long haul trucking, which was you know discussed earlier today in the presentation to these other various critical pinch points within the supply chain. And until those wages become meaningful, where someone can work this job at a 40 hour clip and still be able to have weekends off and their evenings with their families, uh, you're not going to have enough people, enough manpower to, to do that. And so I think you're going to see a continued inflationary trend coming out of those supply chain issues, whether it's construction costs or what have you. So I think that's a near term uh, consequence that we need to address that that is going to be hard to, to unravel. Scott, you looked like you had something you wanted to chime in on that question. Um, um, no, it's an interesting We've had some. We've been we've been talking about like that as it relates to childcare. So one of the things that popped out of this that became real clear quickly that, and everybody knew it beforehand, but going in, 
into the pandemic, everybody knew, but coming out of the pandemic, you know, um, public school is, is a form of daycare, right? I mean, it is, and to some extent, um, well, and that's covered through taxes, and there's a way that the government, the society kind of supports that. Um, we don't do that with, with our daycare that's before that, um, but there's an interesting, that's always been a, a public good kind of conversation about, well, you know, that's, but, but it's no longer about the public good. I think part of what we're realizing, it's becoming, this is a labor force, an economic issue about how do we support these things? How, how do you support childcare in a way that you can afford to get a workforce and you can keep people in the labor force so that you can have economic stability and economic growth, right? What is, what is the public good role in that? Um, I think that conversation is different now than it was two years ago. It's the same with um, the education stuff. The education conversation has been going on for years around that and less about wages, right? Um, but it factors into what you can get with where the wages can take you, the um, opportunity and equity that there is about who gets to go to college and how that works and what those opportunities are and when you can get into them and how you can get into them. All of that type of stuff factors into ultimately to what people can earn because it leads back, it starts with what can you get into, what can you learn, what are you able to do, and how can you leverage that in the labor force. Um, I think all those things, that, that type of stuff is going to become a bigger conversation. I hope it becomes a bigger conversation. I'm not saying I have the answers. I just think it's really interesting now as a way to look at this that we're not really talking about public good anymore. We should be talking about what, what factors impact the public labor force that we need to be focused on so that we can insulate ourselves somewhat from something like this happening again. Brianne, what are uh, what, what are you seeing from your perspective on uh, the role that, uh, that 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 inflation is playing in in, in wage growth? Um, is the cart leading the horse there? I think it's absolutely tied. Um, I mean, when I've been working with clients to encourage them to increase their pay rates over the last almost two years now, um, you know, their the biggest thing is they say I can't afford it, um, or you know, and I think that when I try to explain to them, going back to why they should increase it, is you know, I, I try to explain to them, yes, you're going to pay more um, to pay your employees more, but you're going to be able to retain them. You're going to have less turnover. You're going to spend more on recruiting because you're going to be able to keep those employees there and happy. Um, so I try to explain to them that there's a lot of case studies that actually show that if you increase the pay rates, you may not necessarily be paying more for your workforce um, if you can retain those employees at that higher pay rate. So that aside, the ones that are still in, having the turnover, which we're naturally having during this pandemic, um, I think that they're having to increase their the the prices for their products, and so that is having us having to pay more for products. And I think it's absolutely tied. I'm not an expert on infl inflation, but I'm seeing it. And usually, the the fight back from the clients when I try to have them increase that pay rate is I can't afford it, or it's going to cause us to have to increase our prices. And that's that's what we're seeing. Um, I don't have a I don't have a solution for it, but absolutely would say it's tied. Oops, Wade, you haven't uh, haven't gotten a chance to weigh in on this one yet. Well, I think that the responses have been really um, really interesting and really good. Um, I I would just say to Brianne's point about wages, uh, just another another way to think about it as an employer is uh, um, I, I know with I know with our large hotel employers. They invest nearly twenty five hundred dollars in just on onboarding a hotel housekeeper, um, or a culinary worker, um, or a convention services worker, and um, uh, and 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 honestly, uh, for that amount of money um, to not have the not have the um, features and the tools to keep that that to keep that worker um, uh, is it, it's just it's just burning through it's burning through cash that could have gone to wages instead. Uh, one thing that I'm surprised hasn't come up in anyone's comments so far is housing. Um, and I think this is something that we hear about all, all over our region and for different reasons in different places, uh, you know, in Montana in particular, Scott, I know there's uh, in some of the, the hotter markets in Montana, severe housing cost problems are preventing, uh, uh, preventing uh, the, the workforce from growing, or at least that's what we hear from folks out there. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how housing fits into the picture, whether there's whether there's a way forward on that, whether this is something that's on workers' minds when they're when they're when they're trying to 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 figure out their uh, their, their 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 labor market employment decisions. Uh, yeah, I think it's definitely on their mind. We hear it all the time, um, and it is. It's we're okay. I mean, I think like every place, we're okay with um, the workforce that we have. 
Um, the problem is the in-migration, we've seen our computer, our consumer spending got increased 25% last year in the state. Um, but our workforce hasn't necessarily done the same thing, right? I mean, in, in the city, I'm in Helen in particular, our population grew 14% last year, but we have less businesses operating last year than we do than we did the year before. So where are those people going? Um, they're coming, they're spending money, um, they're buying houses, they're they're getting in someplace, but they're not getting they're not getting into the labor, they're either not coming to the labor force or they're precluding the people that are trying to get a labor force from being able to do that. Um, it's a huge issue. It's one, uh, it's interesting though, right? The, uh, that's always been one of the, the pillars of workforce challenges, um, and, but different than childcare where particularly with ARPA funds, we have seen an influx and a great interest from our legislature and the public about, hey, how do we solve the childcare issues? using ARPA funds, and there's been a glut of money dumped in for that from the feds and from the state, there hasn't been the same commitment on the housing side, which is interesting. Um, it gets talked about a lot, but there's not a lot of solutions. And I don't know, I, I'm not an expert in that by any stretch. Um, I am curious, we are curious if that is just because there's, it's a harder thing to solve or if because there's really not interest that, that that's just deemed as, it's more of a secondary workforce issue than a direct one that people are seeing childcare being a direct one now. Um, I really don't know. One of the things that we have asked for is, um, candidly, I don't know if I should say this publicly, but um, I will. We've asked for, like, could you use some ARPA money to fund um, building 3D houses um, as a project and try and using that as kind of a pilot project to understand what impact does that have on the other construction, on the, the traditional home construction, residential construction market in the state? What types of things do you need to understand around how you how you stand up those things? Because there are articles in the paper about people doing it in 24 hours, right? There's a neighborhood in Texas and Arizona and uh, Virginia just did some, um, I think, through Habitat. Um, a very fascinating way to stand up some, some reasonably affordable housing in a quick way. Um, that's one of the things that we thought maybe would get some traction and get some funding, and there hasn't. And so um, I think housing is absolutely an issue. Uh, and it's, it's, it's precluding our ability to expand our workforce. We have 10,000 more jobs now, vacancies every month on average than we did a year, than we did two years ago. So clearly there's a need for workforce. We have housing for the people that are here, but the people that we need to come in to fill those other ones, we don't have any place to put them. And there's just, it's interesting that there's not a lot of political appetite yet to put money towards that solution. Um, that's not really an answer to anything. It's just kind of a statement of the situation, but uh, that's the deal. I'd call it an answer. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'll add, actually, just incidentally, I happened to speak to the South Dakota legislature the other day. We don't have anyone from South Dakota on this panel, um, but they, they're, they're actively discussing something that you just brought up, which is whether or not, um, whether or not ARPA monies can be allocated for construction of workforce housing. Uh, I don't think they've, uh, I, they're just at the beginning of their legislative session. I don't know uh, what, what sort of... Uh, uh, what sort of action is likely to happen on that front. But I know it's something that at least in South Dakota and some other places are, are under consideration. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have two folks from the Twin Cities. And of course, in the, here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, we have our own housing challenges. Um, uh, but before I, I ask uh, Wade and Joe to chime in, I'm wondering, Brianne, if you can kind of give uh, your thoughts on the UP, uh, the housing, how the, how the housing question there plays into the, the labor supply. Yeah, absolutely. We are in need of affordable housing in Marquette. It is a very hot topic um, that is is in the newspaper all the time on Facebook groups. Um, we need affordable housing in Marquette, and there actually is a committee that our city council put together to try to solve the issue. Um, I had the opportunity to do a lot of recruiting last summer because we were slammed, and um, I had somebody on a leave of absence. So I was, you know, answering the phone all day long and. I cannot tell you how many people would call and say, you know, I just applied for this job. I'm really interested. And I'll say, oh, it looks like you live in Grand Rapids or you live in Detroit or you live somewhere else. Um, do you know this job is in Marquette? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, so are you looking to, looking to move here? Do you, what's your plan? And they're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move to Marquette. I just need a job. And the first thing I always say to them is that's great. Um, I would love to have you here. Marquette's wonderful. Have you looked at housing? And if they haven't, I would always, you know, continue on with the employment pre-screening process and not exclude them by any means, but I would encourage them and send them some lists of some housing options of apartment lists that are well known in Marquette. I cannot tell you how many people came back and they're like, 
never mind, I can't do it. Um, so we are absolutely dealing with the housing crisis here in, in the Upper Peninsula, more so in Marquette. Um, it's, it's a great place to live. We're on Lake Superior. We are a very progressive community, um, but affordable housing is not easy to find. So we are seeing it actually affect our offers and our ability to fill positions where people apply, think they can make it happen. They're one of 30 people interviewing for one apartment and they just can't, they can't get it. So it's an issue. I can uh, confirm that Marquette is awesome. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm a native of Michigan, the lower peninsula though, but I have a yeah. lot of love for the UP. And of course that's, uh, that's, that's, in, that's in our ninth district. So awesome. um, uh, now I live in Minneapolis, St. Paul though. And actually I want to talk to, I want to hear from, from Joe and Wade about uh, how you think the housing uh, availab availability, affordability issue here might play into some of these workforce challenges we're talking about. It, from our perspective, it absolutely is a critical feature. Uh, the stabilization of the home for, for our client base and for our community is critical. Um, and we see that as an emphasis, not only locally with our state legislature, but also uh, Mayor Fry and the city council of Minneapolis has looked into it. And then also Minneapolis and St. Paul are situated in Hennepin and Ramsey County. And we saw both Hennepin and Ramsey County expense uh, a lot of their ARPA resources to address housing affordability. Um, one of the things that we kind of noticed that I would put a, just to kind of split some hairs here is uh, for our community and our client base, it's really the stabilization of the home and able to make rent. And so sometimes we see a disconnect with the powers that be who come in advocating new programs to help clients to save 10% on a down payment on a house. Our folks aren't there yet. They're in, in economic straits and crises right now. And so really we saw that kind of come to a head with the rent moratoriums during the height of the pandemic, which were absolutely critical to stabilize the workforce in order to be able to, to make ends meet. And I, I don't think we've really emerged that far from there. Uh, and so until we can get our community advanced with meaningful wages to where they can start thinking about savings and putting down a meaningful down payment on owning a home, right now it's just getting rent paid and getting wages that can successfully achieve that. And I think that's gonna be the focus for a, a, a few years here until wages start to meaningfully move up. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned, um, and one thing I wanted to ask about specifically was the rent stabilization measures that uh, recently, they recently passed in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and whether you see any headway happening with that. And I don't know if you wanna weigh it on that, Wade. Uh, yeah, we're, we're really pleased to see uh, both of the ballot initiatives in Minneapolis and St. Paul pass and uh, the, the councils and the two mayors will be working that out here in the in the next few months. It's uh, it, I think it, it provides at least some kind of platform to create to create a just, you know, really a, a better process moving forward for everyone. Uh, we've been talking about affordable housing for many years here uh, the challenge the challenges for many workers that work in downtown Minneapolis or or in downtown St. Paul in that hospitality infrastructure that's so important to the two cities. Um, the, the idea that, that workers have to come downtown from, from a first or a second ring suburb um, uh, to work here and not be able to go to a South Minneapolis uh, neighborhood where there are safe schools and good housing and near their mosque or their church um, it just it, it, it's just upside down. And so anything that we can do to provide a better platform, I think, for housing is, is just really, really important. Uh, well, this has been a great conversation and we've gotten a lot of questions in the Q&A, some of which we've been able to address. Um, and uh, I, I think we could probably keep going for another hour here at least, but uh, we promised our audience that we would that we would conclude this before lunchtime. So I do want to uh, thank you all for joining us here and um, and uh, have the love to have the audience give you a virtual round of applause, uh, which we would be able to do if we were here in person. So uh, really, really do appreciate. And once again, uh, as with our last discussion, this conversation, I think really helps illustrate, I hope for those listening, why uh, we're we're continuing to increase and expand our outreach to workers and to work to, to folks who represent workers to hear uh to hear, to hear from, from, from that side, uh, from, from the worker side of the economy, because this is growing increasingly more important, uh, especially during, during this period. So thank you so much for joining us here today and, uh, and we'll be in touch. <clears throat> and with that, I am going to turn it over now to my colleague, uh, Carmi Matson, who is going to, to uh, wrap us up and take us to the finish line today. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, my name is Carmiana Matson. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Regional Outreach 
and public programs at the Minneapolis Fed. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists and all of you, our attendees, for joining us today for what has been a very interesting and informative discussion. And we'd like to keep this conversation going with you, our audience members. We are always looking to increase the economic intelligence that we gather from a variety of sources. And so we'll be sending all of you a follow-up email next week. It will contain a link to the video of this event, as well as copies of Eric's and Ron's slides. Those will also be published on our website next week for others who may have an interest in them. And that email will also include some links to some additional studies that we've done, as well as a link to the most recent edition of the Minneapolis Fed's Beige Book, which Neil referenced earlier in the presentation and which Joe was Joe and Ron both, we're talking about the need to diversify our inputs for that. So we hope that you're reading our beige book and we'll send you a link to that. We would also love to see you at our future events. Today's event, we were heavily focused on that new input that we're receiving from workers and minority and women owned businesses. But as mentioned, we also do a considerable amount of outreach to businesses in our region. And our next event will be held on Friday, February 4th at 9 a.m. It will be a webinar. And that will feature the results of a couple of different surveys that we currently have in the field. One is a survey just to general businesses throughout the 9th district. The other is an annual survey that we do that is specific to manufacturers. So if you'd like to hear the results of those two surveys, please register for our next webinar on February 4th. We're going to be dropping a registration link to that event in the chat, and we will also send a registration link in your follow-up email. And lastly, we'd love to hear what you thought about our event today and your suggestions for future events. So your follow-up email will also contain a link to a feedback survey for this event. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event on February 4th.